Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CSIS on this beautiful morning. I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at CSIS and Director of our Global Health Policy Center. We're really delighted today to have this major conference on polio, uh, and we're thrilled and honored to have Senator McConnell here to uh, kick things off. My boss, Dr. John Hamry, will do the introductions in a moment. I want to offer special thanks and congratulations to my colleagues, particularly Nellie Bristol and Isra Hussein, for pulling together the dinner last night and this complicated and really impressive program of speakers over the course of today, including uh, videotaped uh, communications from Dr. Tedros at WHO and, and Chris Elias from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, we're at a period, as we'll see over the course of the day, we're at a period of uh, in the end game on the global eradication effort, 30 years into this effort, and it's a moment of pride and excitement and a certain amount of anxiety and uncertainty and debate. There's no question we've had truly remarkable uh, progress and that this is a complicated and remarkable moment. The partners, uh, Rotary, CDC, WHO, UNICEF, the Gates Foundation deserve enormous praise for the discipline and commitments that have been made over these decades. Gavi, the International Vaccine Alliance, deserves enormous credit for the role that it is assuming now. There are many fundamental questions that are in front of us. Uh, most importantly, this is a form of health security. Uh, the, we have to operate more effectively in disordered settings like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Northeast, Nigeria. The investment in basic Im immunization infrastructure for polio in many low-income countries is the most basic capacity for surveillance and, and for uh, immunization capacity for those societies. We've learned a lot in the last 30 years about operating amidst conflict in doing multiple campaigns against polio. Uh, as we'll hear today, there's debate over what is the end game, how do we define success, when do we define it, in what timeline. Uh, and we have to complete the, complete the work while also thinking about the future and, 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 and transitioning towards preserving those assets and repurposing them for broader and endurable benefits. That's not so easy to do. Um, we uh, began last night with many of our speakers that have come a distance to be here with us, gathered together with Dr. Redfield, uh, director of CDC, for a very animated discussion around many of these same issues, and we'll continue that today. Dr. Redfield has a family emergency uh, unforeseen, which uh, uh, keeps him from being here today. He sends his greetings, and, and fortunately, uh, uh, John uh, Bertoy from uh, CDC is going to uh, stand and deliver his speech and take um, uh, uh, questions and, 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 and provide comments over the course of that. So uh, with, with that, thank you all so much for joining us today. And to all of our speakers who've come a distance, thank you so much. And Senator McConnell, thank you. John? Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm John Hamry, the president at CSIS. Before we have public events like this, we always have a little safety announcement. And either Steve or I are going to make sure you're safe. If you hear a voice that tells us we have to evacuate, the exits are right behind us here on the stage. There's a stair right closest to this one. We'll go down one flight down to the street. We'll take two left-hand turns, take a right turn, go over to National Geographic, and I'll buy tickets for everybody to see the Titanic show. It's really good. It's really... <laughs> It's really impressive. People don't know that that was a cover story for a secret operation to try to recover the scorpion. Uh, it's a fascinating story. You should go take a look at it sometime. We're very fortunate to have uh, Senator McConnell with us today. Uh, his world changed overnight because there was an announcement of a Supreme Court nomination, and he is going to race up to the Hill to start the process of confirmation for the new Supreme Court justice nominee. Uh, I'm very grateful that Senator McConnell would join us. He has a personally very moving personal story about polio. I, I can remember as a young kid uh, when the vaccine was first made available, we'd line up on Sunday afternoon, we'd go up to the courthouse, and that little sugar tablet, you know, and 
it was quiet, orderly. It was almost like a communion, you know. We were, and the, what stood out in my mind was how much people trusted the government to do the right thing to help them. Gosh, I wish we could get back to that era. And fortunately, we do have government people with us today who are doing that for America every day. We're very fortunate that Senator McConnell, with all of his astounding responsibilities, uh, has championed uh, polio eradication. He has held this up personally. Uh, as, a, as an emblem of what America can do, and he has been insistent that the government shoulder its responsibilities to help with the global eradication of polio. This is a unique contribution from a very, very busy man. Would you please welcome him with your warm, some warm applause? <laughs> you. Well, thank you, John, and good morning. Um, I'm really happy to be here. This is a uh, extremely important and personal issue with me. Uh, Dr. Morrison, CSIS, uh, our partners at USAID, Rotary International, the Gates Foundation, this has been an extraordinary collaborative effort. I wasn't invited to speak uh, today because you all needed me to bring you up to speed on the latest particulars in the fight to eradicate polio, quite the opposite. I'm sure I could learn a lot from each of you. All of you are the experts. You're manning the front lines of this fight. So I want to take this opportunity to offer a few big picture observations for your consideration and also express my personal gratitude uh, to all of you. Because while it's an honor for me to stand here in my capacity as Senate Majority Leader, it's a particular honor to thank you in a different capacity as a polio survivor myself. My first memory in life um, was the last visit to Warm Springs, Georgia. I was two years old. Um, my dad was in Europe uh, fighting the Germans. We lived in Athens, Alabama, but my mother decided while dad was overseas to go live with her sister in a different part of Alabama, which was literally just a farm crossroads. There wasn't even a stoplight. All five points, Alabama. And um, so the local doctor thought I had the flu. And when the flu went away, they noticed a paralysis in my left leg the quadricep, you know, the muscle between the knee and the, the thigh. And of course, he suspected that it was polio and didn't know what to do about it. But fortunately, we were 60 miles from Warm Springs, Georgia, a little over an hour's drive. And he recommended we go over there. And we did. And at that particular point, remember this is 10 years before the vaccine, at that particular point, uh, whatever experts there were on whatever rehabilitation you could achieve were at Warm Springs, Georgia. So I was really lucky to be that close by. They took a look at me and they taught my mother a physical therapy regimen. And they said, we need you to do this four times a day. And listen to this, any of the women in the room who've had children, or even if you haven't, remember I'm two years old, we don't want him to try to walk. Because we think if he tries to walk prematurely, whatever comeback we may be able to get out of applying this physical therapy regimen may fail, and he'll be in a brace the rest of his life. So my mother, like a drill sergeant, literally watched me every waking moment for two years. So I was never a patient at Warm Springs, but she would take me over there periodically and they'd check on the progress. And she told me one time while they were over there, she held me up to a window as President Roosevelt drove by. And um, so after two years, my first memory in life was our last visit to Warm Springs, where the nurse 
told my mother, I think he's going to be okay. Looks like he'll be able to walk without a limp and without a brace and have a normal childhood. So that was my first memory in life. The, um, the hero of my story, obviously, is my mother. How many mothers would have had the discipline to basically put everything else aside and just watch a two to four year old all day, every day, to make sure I didn't try to walk too soon. The, um, so the story of my life is that with the exception of some difficulty you know, going downstairs, I have kind of a slight limp. I've had a normal, normal life. But as all of you know, in those days, um, you could end up dying. You could end up in an iron lung. You could end up horribly disabled. Some people even miraculously had a complete comeback. And 10 years later, I can remember as John uh, or uh, John uh, mentioned earlier that um, when the um, vaccine came out, there was a palpable, audible sigh all across uh, America. And all of us uh, kids in school would be uh, taking the vaccine. So in the late 80s, when the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was formed, it was estimated the disease still paralyzed 350,000 people a year. Since that time, polio cases have fallen more than 99%. All of you are on the cusp of an extraordinary accomplishment here. And I'm told we're sort of down to, what, Afghanistan and Pakistan? But there's also an important effort to keep it from coming back. Um, this is a huge victory, and it didn't happen by magic. It happened because of the people in this room, because of organizations like those represented here. And it happened because, as far as I can tell, you've kept a few key principles in mind, a few key concepts that, frankly, I try to practice here in Washington. One of them is persistence, persistence. I think it's underappreciated outside the public health community, just how much hard work and innovation has to continue once a disease has dropped off the front pages. If the enemies of polio were to take their foot off the gas, progress could erode rapidly. You've kept it even as the spotlight has moved on to other diseases. That, my friends, is persistence. Another key quality has been patience. You've understood that all along this was a decades-long fight, not a short scramble. I know that can be difficult. My mom reminded me that patience wasn't exactly my strong suit as a four-year-old during the treatments that I described to you. I was actually anxious to get up and go play. Imagine how much it took to deter that on the part of my mother. Fortunately, that didn't last. Throughout my career in politics, I've found that enduring success only comes to those who have the patience to play the long game. I'm just lucky that my caregivers were willing to be patient and play the long game. Researchers were willing to play the long game. Today, the polio eradication effort is proof of what it looks like to win the game or very close to winning the game. And along the way, the third big lesson, I think you have shared some of the very best of America with the word. Many of you know that prior to becoming Republican leader, I was either the chairman or the ranking member of the State Foreign Operations Subcommittee for many years. I've always believed that our national security is enhanced when we employ foreign assistance in pursuit of strategic objectives. And over the past decade, we can be proud that the State Foreign Operations Subcommittee has appropriated more than a half a billion dollars to polio eradication efforts alone. Our nation should continue to reach out and engage the rest of the world. 
But success stories like the discovery and propagation of the polio vaccine show us how much good is done and has always been done as part of our foreign policy. I've always been a big believer in the non-defense part of what we do overseas. You know, everybody criticizes foreign assistance. They assume we're wasting an enormous amount of money. The truth of the matter is, you know, it is a fraction, tiny fraction of what we spend every year. And you get a lot more bang for the buck, certainly, than having to send in the military. <laughs> Regretfully, that's necessary from time to time, but we do an awful lot of good with a very small percentage of what we spend every year. All the researchers and experts and academics and nonprofits and entrepreneurs whose hard work and good efforts have spilled over our borders and have actually helped transform the world into a better place for everyone. So you should be proud. We all should. This is America at its finest. Think of the countries where polio remains, as we were saying, like Afghanistan and Pakistan, as well as a few other countries with circulating vaccine-derived cases, and ponder the security environment in each of those countries. Think of the progress that your efforts could achieve if we could reduce the level of conflict in each place. Think of the progress that could be made if we reduced the presence of insurgents, those who teach an erroneous version of the Koran, and those spreading disinformation about vaccine programs. The people of these countries have witnessed brutal conflict and many of you have been in the fight to eradicate polio in those daunting places. But more broadly, I want to ask you to keep up the persistence and keep up the patience, the same qualities that I was talking about in my mother. I know there are many other pressing battles. Resources are always limited. But I've been in Washington long enough to see what happens when victory is declared prematurely. When you plan the victory party before you truly finish your homework. And keep sharing the best of our nation's and the world's values. Our brain power, our innovation, and our heart with people who need it. A vaccine is really an amazing thing. In a way, it's better than even the best treatment or cure because it preserves a normal childhood and a normal life from the very beginning. How many stories like mine never had to be written because the international community took action? How many families never had to give a second thought to their ch children's first pair of walking shoes? Weren't given any reason to mark it as a particularly special occasion. So on their behalf, and on mine, my final words are, thank you all. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Laurie Sloat. I'm the Senior Director for Global Health. Uh, can you hear me? Is the mic on? No. Okay. <laughs> Wait till it turns on. Is that better? They assured me I didn't have to touch a button. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> okay. Hi, good morning. I'm Laurie Sloat. I'm the Senior Director for Global Health at the UN Foundation here in DC. And I'm thrilled to be moderating our first panel this morning. So following on Senator McConnell's comments this morning, you can see that the U.S. role and involvement in polio eradication has been critical with, he had mentioned that in the last decade it's about a half a billion dollars of appropriations, but it's also been about $3 billion overall. So it's the largest government donor to the initiative. And when you think of the global polio initiative itself, 
it's, it's a phenomenal global public health movement, really, in terms of harnessing, it's massive, harnessing governments, UN agencies, foundations, volunteers, partners worldwide. And so if you think of back in 1988, and you mentioned this as well, but another statistic I like to think of that I think is amazing as an advocate for, for this initiative is that in 1988, there were 20 polio cases occurring worldwide every half an hour. And in 2017, there were 22 cases for the whole year. So we can't lose sight of the successes that this unique public partnership has brought us. And at the same time, we have to face and conquer the challenges that the polio endgame brings in terms of reaching that last mile, people in the hardest to reach places. So what can we do to ensure US support, continued support, not only for global polio eradication, but also how do we maximize the investments that have been made to build public health, global public health capacity in terms of immunization and health security? So the panel today is going to focus on the US role in the current and future um, role for eradication efforts. And I'm joined here by Dr. Will Schluter, who's the director for the Global Immunization Division within the Center of Global Health at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And um, following uh, his remarks, we'll have uh, Irene Cook from, she's the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator um, for Global Health at USAID. So we're going to hear from both Will and Lorraine today about their agency's perspectives of what they've been doing in terms of the role for polio eradication, but then also the challenges for completion and how the agency's role might evolve given a post-polio world. So following their comments, I'll ask a few questions, and then I'd love to open it up for questions and comments from you all and really encourage a discussion and dialogue this morning. So I'll turn it over to Will to start us off. Thanks, Lori. <clears throat> so um, Lori had asked us to, to address about three questions, and, um, and so I'll just um, go through those questions one by one. Um, so the first question was really, what, uh, what is CDC's involvement in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative? And CDC is a core partner of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, along with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, Rotary International, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And CDC has been involved with the Global Polio Eradication Initiative since its inception. Um, as an implementing partner, CDC provides both financial support through US government appropriations, as well as scientific and technical uh, expertise in polio eradication efforts worldwide. So we work jointly with the Global Polio Eradication Initiative partners and ministries of health to monitor polio virus spread uh, worldwide and to plan immunization activities um, or um, response uh, campaigns uh, in multiple countries. Um, maybe just to back up a little bit, so uh, I think it's uh, Senator McConnell and others have mentioned that you know the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was really started in uh, 1988 when the World Health Assembly, which is the governing body for the World Health Organization, um, declared that they wanted to work towards uh, global eradication. Um, and um, a lot of progress was made in those, those first 10 years. It was, you know, there was low hanging fruit and a lot of countries moved rather quickly uh, in eradicating uh, or interrupting circulation of polio virus. And then in 1999, um, uh, there was really a feeling that uh, we needed more sort of boots on the ground and that was sort of the the legacy or history of CDC, and so um, CDC started the Stop Transmission of Polio uh, program, which was um, where uh, cadres of uh, volunteers were deployed internationally, and they would spend uh, three months at a time uh, supporting uh, polio eradication efforts, either supporting immunization or strengthening surveillance. Um, that uh, program continues to this day, um, has uh, changed several times. In the early days, the majority of volunteers were actually CDC staff. Um, now, uh, more than about 95% of the volunteers that are trained are actually coming from African countries. 
um, and uh, are mostly redeployed to um, other African countries, which helps build national capacity when they um, return uh, to their home countries. Uh, and then between uh, uh, 2000 and 2010, uh, there was some steady progress, but again, there, there seemed to be some stagnation in progress by the end of 2010. And so CDC activated the Emergency Operations Center and declared um, polio eradication an emergency. And I think that that incentivized um, and led the way then for uh, uh, the World Health Assembly, again, to make a declaration in 2011 and, and um, describe polio eradication as a global public health emergency. And so CDC's Emergency Operations Center is still activated and has been for the last six and a half years working on polio eradication efforts. And so now whenever there's a, a polio outbreak or case, um, it also then uh, has set an example for local ministries of health to declare uh, polio eradication also a, a national public health emergency. And then maybe um, one other innovation that CDC has been supporting is the national stop programs, which is the national stop transmission of polio programs. And so that's sort of an, an extension of what we've done globally, but uh, it's, a, it's an activity where we support countries to develop uh, national staff who then can be redeployed uh, you know, within the country to support polio eradication efforts. And that provides lots of advantages because they're already familiar with the language and culture and can work in um, locations where sometimes international staff can't work. Um, maybe then, uh, so CDC supports in a variety of other ways. We have a global specialized laboratory where every polio virus is sequenced so that we can determine where um, transmission is uh, occurring or what kind of polio virus it is. Um, we're uh, promoting innovation, uh, strengthening workforce capacity, uh, supporting routine immunization, and we also provide funding for vaccine purchase. Um, to go to the second question, sort of uh, the overview of the major challenges to completing polio eradication, uh, let me just be brief to say that, um, that as Senator McConnell said, polio virus now circulates only in the most remote or most difficult or conflicted, uh, conflict affected countries uh, or locations in the world. And so those major challenges are not new to you uh, or can be uh, easily guessed that, you know, it's, it's really accessing those hard to reach populations in insecure areas that are in emergency settings with weak immunization systems uh, and difficult um, surveillance. Um, and so then we also um, really focusing in Afghanistan and Pakistan on reaching mobile or migrant populations who um, are making uh, long distance travel between the two countries. Um, I think that uh, right now, I can say that I think that we have the ability and the knowledge to deal with the challenges uh, through uh, recent innovations. We just have to make sure that the political will and funding holds out. And uh, maybe it's like sort of juggling the balls and trying to keep, keep everything in the air at the same time is our, is our big challenge right now to make sure that worldwide um, we have adequate surveillance and immunization activities to reach the goal of global eradication. And then the third question that Lori asked us to address is just uh, plans, uh, CDC's plan for moving into or, or easing into transition. Um, I think that we understand that uh, we really need to focus on long-term planning in a post-polio world uh, to ensure that the world remains permanently polio-free. Even after the last wild polio virus is detected, um, we have uh, probably at least 10 or 12 years that we need to continue working to make sure that we have adequate surveillance um, and that we're continuing with IPV vaccination. Um, we feel that that's best done by integrating uh, polio vaccination um, with IPV or inactivated polio vaccine and surveillance activities 
um, into integrated vaccine preventable disease control efforts. And so to protect the US government investment so far in order to um, secure the health of Americans and the world um, in general in the future, um, I think that we really need to think about polio transition really as about polio integration so that we transition the polio assets and infrastructure um, into an integrated vaccine preventable disease platform. If we strengthen routine immunization to provide IPV um, as an injectable vaccine, we also build the country's capacity to provide other life-saving vaccines. Um, if we think about strengthening the capacity or maintaining co country's capacity for a polio surveillance, that um, provides a good platform uh, for early detection and outbreak response for other um, vaccine preventable diseases or other infectious diseases um, in general. Um, and then um, the last component of transition or in the post certification is that we need to really make sure that we contain all polio viruses uh, to protect against either accidental or intentional release of polio virus. Um, and so at this time, CDC is really focusing on the polio affected or polio endemic countries, as well as intensifying work in the few um, countries or geographic areas um, where the most unvaccinated children or the most uh, children die from uh, vaccine uh, preventable diseases. Of course, through this transition process, it's really important that we do it in a way not to jeopardize uh, our main objective, which is to achieve polio eradication. Thanks, okay, Lori. great, thanks. Um, I'll hold off on my questions and have Irene go ahead. Great, first. thank you, Lori, mm -hmm. and thanks, Bill, for that. And I also wanna thank CSIS and, and Senator McConnell. The support we've had from Congress, as you've been hearing, has been a tremendously important to, I think, the work that, that we all do, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, I also wanna thank Rotary, the kind of the, the from the very, very beginning, Rotary's advocacy for polio has made such a difference around the world as we've been hearing. So USAID has been a, a part of, formerly part of the global polio eradication effort since 1996, when championed by the US Coalition for Polio Eradication, led by Rotary. Uh, Congress established a specific directive or earmark of funding for both USAID and CDC. And our directive started at about $20 million and has grown to $59 million in 2018. However, our work in polio actually started before that. We had provided seed grant to Rotary in the 1980s and then also supported PAHO through the 80s and the 90s as part of the, the effort that PAHO is doing to eradicate polio in the Western Hemisphere region. That work through both PAHO established some of the technical strategies needed to eradicate polio. And as we all know, by 1994, the region was certified polio free. Since uh, 1996, our, we've supported uh, activities in 27 countries, primarily through grants to WHO and UNICEF. And these grants support the work that WHO and UNICEF do in surveillance, independent monitoring, social mobilization, lab accreditation, containment, and outbreak response. For example, our, we funded uh, surveillance medical officers who identify and investigate the majority of polio suspected cases in these 27 countries. They've been really essential to polio eradication, but really invaluable for surveillance for other diseases such as measles and have been part of the first responder effort, whether they be natural disasters or other things in a number of countries. So we have also supported technical assistance through some of our partners such as JPIGO and JSI and the Communication Initiative. And then although not formally part of our work for polio, um, we have provided long-standing support for Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and through our bilateral programs at the, the country level. We've helped support immunization campaigns as we'll reference that's really core to what needs to happen now and in the future for polio. And what we really wanna see is how these efforts really do come together now and in the future. Also, a significant component of our support uh, to polio eradication has been our extensive support, a lot of support through NGOs. This has been primarily channeled through the core group, a consortium of NGOs led by World Vision that works also through local NGO, provides grants, subgrants to local NGOs at the country level. This is very, very much in line with Administrator Mark's green vision for building local capacity of local partners, but it's certainly an incredibly important part of what's happened with polio. 
The work of the NGOs has been really instrumental in reaching the hardest to reach, the uh, border populations, marginalized groups, and mobile populations, which have been a really a critical component to polio eradication success so far. This community, through these NGOs, we support community-based surveillance, extending the WHO surveillance effort and community mobilization in partnership with UNICEF and reaching communities that routine immunization and immunization campaigns often have difficulty accessing. For example, in Somalia and South Sudan, the NGO network identified 70% of suspected polio coming from communities as well as from these communities, these marginalized communities, and organized vaccination at the border populations. In India, the communication and evidence-based social mobilization strategies reduced vaccine refusals in the four hot districts in Uttar Pradesh from 40% to less than 1% using trusted, well-trained, and supervised women from the community. So in 1998, the World Health Assembly, member states signed a resolution to eradicate polio, actually by 2000, but, but we do remain committed to achieving that goal of eradicating polio and helping countries to smoothly transition from the need for po focused polio efforts once eradication is fully achieved. But as Will and Lori mentioned, as we heard earlier today, that's going to be a very complex task and much, much more work needs to be done. So I want to just touch on some of the challenges, and many of these uh, Will talked about, but you know, first the challenges as we get close to eradication is that you know, we've not yet interrupted wild virus. While the numbers have come down significantly, we're not yet there, and while it's currently circulating in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But accessing all children with repeated vaccinations has been really difficult due to active fighting, suspicion of health workers, variable quality of campaigns, and reaching populations on the move. Health workers continue to be targeted and killed, and killed, but they continue to work regardless of that. And also Nigeria found wild virus that had been silently circulating for more than four years. So this is another lesson that we need to continue and enhance our surveillance efforts in all of these countries. Another challenge is vaccine-derived polio, which has really complicated what do we, how do we define the end game of polio, and this is, makes it extraordinarily difficult and, and something that the global community is really taking up now and really needs to be clear about what do we mean when we talk about the end of, end of polio. Um, our concern if it is that if vaccine-derived poliovirus is still circulating after polio is, is certified as being eradicated, it will create a great deal of confusion at country level. And it looks and acts like, if it's undetected, it looks and acts like polio, and this is a, a real issue. It, re, it has a lot to do with our, the credibility of eradication, and we need, to, we need to have some clear guidance for countries on this and, and a clearer definition as we go forward. At country level, it's, whether it's wild or vaccine-derived, it looks exactly the same. You know, this, in the last week with the vaccine-derived outbreak in Papua New Guinea, Many of my Asia Bureau colleagues who are not health people were talking all about the polio outbreak in Papua New Guinea. And we have to say, well, it's actually vaccine derived, but that's a, not really a, a helpful distinction, if you will. So as Will mentioned, the, the regular routine immunization is also a challenge. It's quite variable in many, many countries, particularly those that are at risk for polio and something that we all need to work really hard at, at improving and increasing. And then finally, we'll also talk about containment, which is a challenge to full eradication. Now, now, more than 99 facilities in 30 countries that want to store potentially infectious materials for the future. So one of the things we have to do is work with the global community to make sure that really is, is uh, secure. And then finally, the number of countries have done transition plans, and this is a really good start to the effort, but a number of those plans are weak and are only looking at a piece of, of the larger puzzle. So, and it also has to do with how are we defining or what do we mean when we're talking about eradication to make sure those transition plans really do take into account all the work that needs to be done now and over the next 10 or 12 years, as well as into the future, so that the assets that have been developed for polio in, in systems and surveillance officers and the NGO networks and other things can be adapted to, to other needs for, for public health and number of programs. So there's an awful lot of work to be done, and I think the, these kind of discussions to really help us think about what do we need to do now, building on what's happened so far, but being really clear about what's the, what are the next stages and how does this effort really evolve going forward is really critical. Thanks. Okay, great, thanks. So I, I have two questions, and just to reflect a, a, a few comments I made. Um, Will, I really liked how you moved through um, how one of the things I think that is so great about the initiative is how it adapts to 
the disease and the progress and the challenges that you know we don't know about. We didn't know a lot of things 30 years ago when we started off. And so you had gone through in 1988 how CDC's response, you know, low hanging fruit, 99 the stop program, but even that moved sort of from volunteers from CDC to build capacity with people from the countries themselves and moving to other countries in 2000 and so on. So my question is in terms of this tricky balance, right, that we talk about, we still need to focus our efforts to get everything done, and that requires enormous patience and concentration, as Senator McConnell said today, McConnell said. And so the, the second thing is, though, how do you ensure that we can leverage the investments that have been made towards benefiting people's health in other ways? You know? so, what has been, can you get a little bit more specific, I would say, and, and you've both raised how your agencies have adapted. Can you get a little bit more specific of what that might look like? Like how have you, maybe it's not necessarily restructuring, but Will, you talked about integrating um, efforts within, you know, vaccine preventable diseases writ large. Does that require CDC to sort of restructure itself or is it technically in the countries? Can you just talk a little bit more specifically what it looks like to do both of those really difficult tasks, eradicating, but then also leveraging the assets for other um, right. benefits? Thanks, Lori. I think that that's a, a really important question and, and it's one that we've been thinking a lot at CDC in the global immunization sphere. Um, a lot over the last uh, year and a half or so uh, since I've been in that position as the director. You know, the, um, they, they are really big tasks, mm -hmm. but as, as, I've, as I've talked to people around the, the world, uh, you know, what, what's went right, what's went wrong. I mean, the, this global eradication effort has been now ongoing for 30 years. Um, and you know, are there any lessons learned that we could take from that process? I think that, I think one of the feedback, and not as a criticism, but you know, it was pretty easy to get through that low-hanging fruit. But we kind of left the toughest places for last, mm -hmm. um, the the most populous, the most densely populated, the most uh, conflict-affected, the most insecure. And so, if we really want to, you know, make progress, not only to achieve eradication, but also then to help in our transition efforts where we're actually supporting an integrated vaccine preventable disease platform. I think that this, the solution is, is that, you know, the, the answer is the same to both of those questions, mm -hmm. that we have to make sure that our immunizations are being provided in a timely way. I mean, campaigns are, are great to reach, uh, you know, a lot of children uh, really quickly, um, but, you know, it would be even better if uh, children were automatically uh, caught as they were born. Um, in most uh, high-risk countries, they provide a zero dose, and so that means that, you know, children are vaccinated at birth. But, uh, you know, it, despite our best efforts of, you know, providing uh, frequent campaigns in countries that are polio endemic or, or polio affected, you know, that, that's never going to be as timely as if, if it was part of the culture that every mother uh, you know, at, uh, at the time of uh, delivery um, had her baby vaccinated with polio vaccine uh, either in a healthcare facility or at home if she, um, if she was, uh, chose to have a home delivery. And, and so those are great points. And so does, do you think that the CDC, does it require a different response? Like is that different from, say, 10, 15 years ago of how it's set up or how it engages with the communities or governments writ large? Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think our focus now is really we want to focus on those hardest places to develop okay. really robust immunization systems that are going to help us achieve eradication in the mm -hmm. polio endemic countries, but it's also going to help develop a platform in those countries that have now interrupted polio but are, you know, really have those characteristics where a lot of children are still dying of vaccine preventable diseases so that we can make really good progress in those, in the, mm -hmm. those areas. And I think it also then um, supporting the surveillance that Irene mentioned that's uh, you know, supported through uh, WHO surveillance officers and others, if we can continue that platform for early detection and response to not only polio, but for other vaccine preventable diseases or other communicable diseases. Okay, great. And Irene, how about from the USAID yes. perspective? Let me just build on a couple of things that Will said. I, I think um, the point about looking for ways to really put the investments into routine immunization systems mm -hmm. is such a, a key piece. And we still have, you know, as I mentioned, Will talked about, we have such variation in, in high coverage of, of overall routine immunization, that, and that's a, a urgent issue that we all need to come together and, and move on. Um, 
Include in building polio into that, particularly through the, the end stages as we move shift to, to IPD vaccine and building that into to systems is going to be really, really important. I mean, one of the, the other pieces indeed surveillance. You know, we do have, exactly as Will said, surveillance officers in a number of countries who have, in a number of cases, d done work beyond polio, beyond looking for, for AFP but making sure there are resources to continue the work of those surveillance officers who are built within the health system to be looking for other issues and other disease issues as whole as countries look at global health security and what do they surveillance is a hugely important part of that. So how can we get resources to continue to support those kinds of officers to keep them in place and keep that network in place? And part of that gets to be the money and this also relates to the NGO networks that are well placed to take on any number of health issues you can imagine, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're out there, they're part of the community, they're there, but making sure we have ways to get the resources to sub continue to support those networks is what's really critical. And that gets to a little bit about how the money has come, mm -hmm. right? The money has come for polio. Mm -hmm. We've been able to use that and build those, some of those platforms. So how can we start to, to evolve those resources to pay for more broader health systems kinds of investments, whether it be for surveillance, for laboratories, for NGO networks, et cetera. And that gets to be the, a little bit of a challenge. I think it's doable, but it's challenging. So that actually is related to my, the second question I wanted to ask, and that's on the investment side, right? So how, I mean, there's a lot of advocates in this room. And so with that in mind of, what, why, why should we invest in, obviously, polio eradication, but then as we're talking here about, say, surveillance. So, I mean, I am a huge fan of the U.S. government's involvement in surveillance. I came quite new into this through the polio initiative, but also measles, to see how much is invested worldwide in surveillance. It's incredible, and it's, it's essentially the radar detection of global health for you know, lots of vaccine preventable diseases. So how does the investment from polio transfer into that? Well, some of it, some say it's subsidized, right? Some that we're doing that otherwise. So how can we convince the US support for continued efforts for things like surveillance that go beyond polio? And what would be your message to the group here so we can help advocate for support for that? So I think that, um you know, as we're talking about polio transition, and Irene mentioned that there were 16 countries that have the largest investment or in polio uh, investments in, in uh, polio resources, as we call them, or, or uh, polio assets. And one of those countries is South Sudan. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, when we were talking with representatives from the South Sudan Ministry of Health, they were describing how the polio surveillance infrastructure is is the most comprehensive the the only existing surveillance system that has this global reach throughout the country or you know na national reach throughout the country that then could be used as a platform for other activities and um i i think i i had uh, you know really the privilege to see firsthand when when I was a CDC staff on detail to WHO in three regions in Africa, the Southeast Asia, and in the Western Pacific, really how the polio infrastructure could, uh, could be used and is used to strengthen surveillance capacity for early detection and the, uh, the response, the early detection and response uh, to the Ebola importation in Nigeria was a perfect example. It was, you know, the polio infrastructure surveillance system that uh, that made them capable of not only detecting early but then effectively uh, mounting uh, a response effort that prevented uh, Nigeria uh, spread of Ebola during the the recent large outbreak in West Africa. Okay, great, all right. Yeah, I would say two things, and this is our input on this question is one I'd love to hear from those yeah. in the room who are <laughs> advocates. Know, but you know, I think talking about um, talking about the the surveillance and the, that kind of infrastructure, the health system is part of the the end stage of of polio. I think is a really important piece that it's not only about looking for AFP, but it's also about building that infrastructure for other things. And I think that looking for ways to talk about polio in that longer stage, I think, is a really important piece. 
The other thing to do is continue to talk about it as part of your public health infrastructure at country level. And you know, increasingly, you know, countries are, are taking on more and more the share of those costs at countries. It's less and less coming from donors, right, and less and less coming from outside. But working with countries who can't afford to start recognizing these staff that have been supported through the polio effort, but that is an integral part of what that country's public health system needs to be. And even as we do sort of catalytic funding over the next couple of years to increasingly try to get domestic resources to pay for that is going to be really important. I think part of that message at country level is key, both for the NGOs as well as those surveillance officers who are there. But I do think it's going to be a tricky message, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is certainly part of polio. And we've been saying that you know once you make these investments, you don't have to make the investments anymore. But how do you talk about that in a way that really does continue to resonate? And I think do I do think there's been over the last several years increasing attention and interest in things like global health security. And surveillance is a core part of what needs to happen for global health security. So tying it there is another opportunity. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you up on that uh, idea of asking the, you all of like what works. And so uh, picking up when you said, you know, is it a tricky message? Are we overcomplicating it in, in a way? You know, it's, there's a lot of money that's going into the infrastructure. We need it for detecting the diseases worldwide. And is, is that a good enough message? You know, isn't, shouldn't that be the case? You know, so a little bit, being a little bit um, provocative here. But, but I mean, think about that in your comments if you'd like to. I'd like to hear some, some reflections on that. But I also would like to open it up to the floor to ask your questions of what you'd like to hear from the, um, the panelists. So any comments or questions? Yes, please. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation, Dave Robinson with World Vision. Thanks very much for kicking us off with your comments and observations. Um, Dave Robinson with World Vision worked in Mauritania on uh, child immunization programming with um, UNICEF, the Ministry of Health, Rotary, and particularly focused on working with local faith leaders, imams, to get the message out with nomadic populations and uh, marginalized uh, groups in the last, getting to the last mile in places that you've mentioned like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, elsewhere. What is the investment, the catalytic investment that you mentioned going into mobilizing faith leaders to sustain the acceptance to overcome the disinformation Senator McConnell mentioned, the, the resistance mm -hmm. that are coming from some faith groups against uh, immunization, particularly child immunization. Could you comment on that? And what is needed into the future in terms of sustaining the support of, of faith leaders, uh, particularly in the Muslim world? OK, why don't we take a few questions, and then we can answer the comments. Yes, please. Uh, I'd love to uh, actually, uh, it has to do with the, first I will start with the campaign. Uh, I had worked in Nigeria when there was, in 2000, starting 2004, 2008, when you had, there was a problem, and then later in Afghanistan. But what I saw in polio was, there was a problem of ownership. The people, the community, families, even the government didn't own the problem, the solution, and what have you. What I heard from Senator uh, Mitch McConnell was very important, concerning the mother owning it and then making sure that they get the, pro we, they get the problem. So, but in those countries, the community, the people, and even the government didn't own it. It was us. I was working with UNICEF. It was us who were thinking, planning, implementing everything. And then there was a problem. And I don't know how far you have gone. The same goes with Afghanistan. All the problem is ownership first. And then the second problem is I, I'm glad that USAID has mentioned it. The money which was spent for polio, all that money, if we had worked, in, in, uh, implemented it for strengthening the routine immunization system, what would have the difference been? The routine immunization 
has been neglected, and then I don't know. Everybody is interested coming up, and then, you know, I, when we have every NIDs, people are waiting for us because we bring money for them. Nobody cared. So what I see is there are two things, ownership and strengthening the routine immunization system. Otherwise, we'll not go anywhere. Sorry to say. Okay. That's my experience. Okay. okay, thank you. Let's take one more, um, and then we'll do another round after. So we'll take three questions and have some answers. And then any other comments or questions? There's one over here. No? Oh, go ahead, Steve. I'll get you in the next round. Steve, do you want to go ahead? Oh. Oh, sorry. I'll get you in the next round. Steve. Okay. okay. Um, I guess my question is, what have been the biggest challenges as um, to perhaps funding or investment or even attention towards polio as it um, was no longer a hot topic as it used to be and um, how have you kind of seen that progression over time to um, still make it an important issue um, that, ne that needs attention still. So. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so let's take those questions. So. Um, uh, who wants to, you can comment on all of them, Erin? Okay, first, so yeah. Erin looks like she's ready to, <laughs> go ahead. All right, I'll start quickly because the first one on faith-based, and thank you for that, Dave. I think that's mm -hmm. a really important point, and where we see the, the work that we've done with World Vision and the, the NGO community as being such an important component of all of this because NGOs and community-based NGOs do indeed work with faith-based you know, leaders at, at the community level, which are hugely important. You know, they certainly, as you described in Mauritania, but in Afghanistan and in, in almost every country, the engaging the faith-based leaders can make such a difference. And that's not only true for polio, it's true for every health intervention that I can think of, right, is engaging the, those leaders as part and parcel of, of getting the message out and getting and, and trying to get out the correct message as opposed to in fighting against some of the rumors and the incorrect messaging is really, really important. So has got to be part of what we do going forward for polio, for immunization indeed, but also for anything in health. So, and that's where, you know, community as part, and community groups as part of your broader public health infrastructure is such an important component, because they can do it to a degree that others, it's much, it's much easier to get at it through community groups has been our experience. So if I can follow up with that, what would you say is needed in the future to sustain that? Like what are some tangible actions of what, what can we do to make sure that that continues? I think two things. One is continuing the investments through those, those NGOs and through the networks, but also making sure that a Ministry of Health sees the value of working with the community groups and, and faith-based, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of both. It's also okay. from, not only from the donor side, but also from countryside, that the public sector in a country does see the value of this, and that certainly happens in a number of places. But looking for ways to facilitate those partnerships is really important. Great, okay. And then, Will, did you want to take the one on ownership and? Um... Actually, if I can just, if I can combine the first sure. two questions and sort of respond to them uh, jointly, because I think that they're they're closely related. So I was in Nigeria in 2004 as well, so in, in uh, working uh, on polio campaigns, and so probably we were working together. Um, you know, the um, I think that the uh, the the two are um, closely related. I think that. The, the Nigeria outbreak really taught us a lesson. I mean, the, the, for, for those in the room who are unfamiliar with that story, in 2003, in northern Nigeria, uh, because of unfounded rumors about vaccine safety, they um, stopped vaccinating against polio, and so there was a, a, a really sizable outbreak of wild polio virus in northern Nigeria in 2003. And that really then affected so many surrounding countries. I was based in Ethiopia at the time, and every every week when the global update came out, the global update which shows uh, polio cases on a map visually, uh, we could see the polio cases coming ever closer to the Ethiopia border. Uh, you know, marching from northern Nigeria as they spread to Central African Republic and then Chad and then to Sudan, and then eventually we had a polio outbreak in Ethiopia as well. And, and I think that, that the lessons we learned from that were that we really had to engage faith-based and community leaders. Um, and so different countries have done that in different ways. Um, in Ethiopia, it was the Orthodox Church that then really promoted the message that vaccination is part of our culture, it's what we do. 
um, in providing vaccination. In Afghanistan and Pakistan right now, there's huge efforts and engagement. In fact, the leadership um, in supporting polio eradication is largely from the religious community where they've come out very strongly to support uh, vaccination and made it very clear that it's, it's uh, now, um, that there's, there's no concern with vaccine safety, that, uh, that uh, the, the vaccines uh, are halal, they can be, the, that there's no problem with uh, religious or conscience uh, for a refusal of vaccine. Um, and then really addressing the third question about vaccine hesitancy is, is um, you know, really related to that. And I think that in all of those situations, um, you know, our success is our biggest risk as we improve the quality of vaccine delivery so that the cases go down, fewer and fewer citizens or mothers recognize the risk from polio virus or any other vaccine preventable diseases. But that's not only mothers, it's also healthcare workers. The majority of nurses and physicians in the United States probably have never seen a case of polio. They've probably never seen a case of measles uh, because our vaccine programs have been so effective. And so they do, really don't understand the, the, the really important mortality that's associated with any of those vaccine preventable diseases. And that's why we have to keep that message uh, in the forefront to, um, to really to emphasize the need uh, of a robust a vaccine preventable disease program. Okay, and then maybe just finally a, a few comments from both of you on the question, again, around the investment. So what's been some of the challenges for the investment, the funding, as we, as polio, you know, drops off, so to speak, the high level political agenda, although I, I think maybe that's it still has some attention, but as we move forward, this patience factor, this persistence factor, and the investments it's going to take, so, so how do we deal with that? So I think at this moment in time, at least for the resources that we get, because we have not yet achieved eradication or have gotten there, the investments coming to us are still coming for polio, right? Um, I think the difficulty comes as we get to this very complex period of mm -hmm. when do you declare eradication what does that look like mm -hmm. that's where i think the the risk will come of well if it's you know if it's if it is indeed after wild virus there's no reason to continue to support polio and i think that's where this complex conversation about what does what does certification mean and when do you certify is part of that question about, about resources and something we need to think about really, really carefully. I think at country level, it goes back to Will's point about, well, why do we need to con you know, continue to invest in polio? We haven't seen a case here in years and years and making, continuing to do that advocacy at country level, I think is really important. But also it gets back to looking for ways to really build polio immunization into routine systems and build those routine immunization systems is quite key. Okay. Any any comments or questions from the? Okay. So I promised Steve first, and then I'll come to both of you. So let's see. Um, one quick comment, and then a question. The comment is, you know, you really do bring across very powerfully each of you um, the longevity and the centrality of American leadership, and. <coughs> That's terribly important. I mean, this is, this is a, a disease that disappeared from America in the late 70s, and yet we've been able to sustain that leadership abroad mm -hmm. uh, for decades now. And it's thankful, and I think we have Congress to thank, I think we have administrations, I think we have the Rotary Foundation, now Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an assembly of interests that have stayed the course and made that possible. My question is around the end game and the whole challenge of vaccine-derived uh, 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 virus, I mean, the, um, it's easy to understand the wild virus challenge, right? It's down, we're down to a handful of cases. We know the geography it's in. We know what it's going to take to disrupt uh, the transmission. We know there are security and other logistical barriers and political will barriers, but there's been steady progress. What gets more confusing and much more ambiguous is this other threat that's out there that we now appreciate in a much bigger way, which is these outbreaks, these cases that are appearing in various surprising places sometimes, uh, and not predicted places, um, different geographies uh, that are vaccine-derived polio, and 
I don't have a very clear idea like what's, how do you communicate to, a, an in, to an interested public, okay, what's the game plan for arresting that form of transmission? Because we're not going to declare victory until we've achieved that, but it's very unclear to me what the strategy is. So maybe you could say just a couple key words on that. I know this is a topic that will be of discussion over the course of the day, but it's very fundamental, I think, to where we are today and how to communicate to a public that is confused. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so this gentleman here and then um, Robert after. Hi, okay. Jim Tilch from George Washington University. Okay. Um, I recognize the funding commitments are really, really important, but also uh, really important is personal m morale, institutional morale, and long-term commitment of your own staff. So, and this, I think, applies both to CDC and USAID, but also, also to Rotary International yeah. in, in terms of how do you maintain the mm -hmm. kind of momentum question. and the commitment among your own staff that are involved in this over now decades of this effort um, and dealing with many of the frustrations where we've had some near misses and some retreats and some progress moving forward. Great question, thanks. Robert? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Robert Steinglass with uh, JSI. Um, just echoing what um, Senator McConnell said about persistence and uh, patience, um, I've always found that a strong and steady wins the race. And uh, it is a challenge to develop health systems in countries. We, we get distracted a lot by the verticality of the disease approaches, which have their own sort of uh, momentum and urgency to uh, reduce uh, incidence of disease, but uh, health development requires a different sort of mindset in many cases. I think USAID could take a lot more credit, frankly, for the role it has been playing in providing continuous support for routine immunization system strengthening. We hear about routine immunization increasingly now from the polio community because of the need to sustain eradication with um, um, inactivated polio vaccine, for example. But in fact, AID has been investing for the last 30 years in strengthening routine immunization systems. And I think uh, AID could take more credit uh, for that work because that, that is the essential starting point for um, polio elimination, as some of the uh, panelists have said, where, health, where immunization systems have been strong and operating through the health system, not as an end run around the health system, uh, we saw polio incidents um, decline very quickly. So I think routine immunization system strengthening c could be recognized more as an essential function that AID has always been playing, just as CDC is recently starting to recognize it as an essential function as well. Um, and I would just add one more point, which is um, I think there's a danger of um, prematurely and perhaps in, in an imbalanced way deciding what are the magic bullets moving forward. I've heard surveillance mentioned many times. It's essential, but it is not the only discipline. Okay. There's also behavioral scientists that are needed. There's information specialists, communication specialists, management and financial specialists as well. And again, that, that speaks to the health development orientation of AID, which is also so important. Civil society, I've heard many times, but again, it's more than civil society and it's more than epidemiology and disease surveillance. There's a need for supporting the health system as well in many of these countries because the health workers oftentimes don't feel very supported and they're not very well supported. They oftentimes don't have the resources and tools that they need um, and encouragement that they need to do their job at the peripheral level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we'll take this next round. So, um, Lorraine, do you want to go first? Yeah, let me start. And Steve, thanks for your point. I think it, it is incredibly important that we look at, you know, the end of polio is the end of all polio, right? Because mm -hmm. it looks exactly the same. You know, as I mentioned, the experience of Papua New Guinea that everybody said, oh, it's a polio outbreak. And well, yes, it is. But it is, you know, even if it was vaccine derived, it looks exactly the same. So. But that means it's very complicated. And I don't know what the technical strategies are once WILD is taken care of exactly, but I think that's got to be part and parcel of how we talk about moving toward the end and whether we talk about it in steps or phases or something that, that is clear about the end of WILD, but recognizing that polio is still out there until we can get overall routine immunization up in IPV mm -hmm. into levels much higher. 
and whatever else we need to do. But I, I do think we have to be really careful and really clear about what that longer term game looks like. And when we declare polio done, that it really is all of polio. And that's, that's got to be critically important. There's a lot of complications around that, including what the Certification Commission has, has currently had. And I, I know there's a whole number of policy issues, but it is something I think we have to be really clear about. Otherwise, there will just be endless confusion. And quite frankly, threats to the credibility of the public health community of, well, you said it was over, but it's not, kinds of things. And that's a, I think that's a huge problem. Um, question on staff fatigue. I do think that's an issue, particularly at country level. And this is where this whole conversation we've been having about how do you make sure we continue doing what's right for polio, build it into the overall system is so, so important, right? So that you do continue that it's, a, it's not just one issue, but it's part of and parcel of another. And just finally, thank you, Robert, for your <laughs> acknowledgement. But I would very much agree with you about the health, broader health system investments. You know, surveillance is critically an important part of that. But it is exactly as Robert described, a whole number of other things have got to be part of building polio and the end of polio into that broader system is really important. It's complicated, right? And we can say, oh yeah, let's just do that. But that it it is quite difficult both for donors and for countries and ministries of health to figure out how do you take these investments and these external resources and build it into your current budget. Mm -hmm. And that's where the complication comes in, but it's something we've got to do. Okay. So um, I, I just, let me just reflect on the comments that were made and just say that the, I, th I think, uh, Steve, you're, you're absolutely correct that American leadership has been central to uh, the progress that we've made in polio eradication so far. And I, I, I really can't emphasize enough, and really from the bottom of my heart, I, it's, I, I sincerely believe it's because of Rotary International that we've been able to make the, the, the progress we've made. Um, the Rotary International has, has been an unbelievable partner in helping to keep the, the focus not only through their fundraising um, efforts that they do worldwide, not just in the United States, but really worldwide, but also the, the advocacy work that they do with governments worldwide and their volunteer base that are really visible in countries around the world. Um, uh, just again and again emphasizing the need to sort of slow and steady um, until we're done with global eradication. The, the issue about vaccine-derived um, polio viruses is a complicated one, and for so some in the room may not really understand. And when you hear the word vaccine-derived, then you think, oh, well, if I just avoid the vaccine, then I'm not at risk, which is actually just the opposite. So vaccine-derived polio viruses only occur in pockets of low immunity, where the live attenuated vaccine can circulate for a long enough period of time that it that it mutates and then develops neurovirulence and can then cause paralysis. And so. Uh, Vaccine-derived polio viruses are prevented through vaccination. They're not prevented through the lack of vaccination. And so I think that is a complicated message. It's one that we need to think about how we talk about um, because it, it's, it's a difficult concept. And when p the public or the media hear vaccine-derived, then I've heard it often said, well, then, you know, why, if we're giving this vaccine, why is it causing this problem? And, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, the beauty of live attenuated vaccine is when you give it to a child, uh, that child then secretes that live virus that, you know, gives a, a boost to household contacts as well. Uh, and so you're really, um, you know, uh, vaccinating not only the child, but the community. And so the, the live attenuated oral polio vaccine has been central to achieving uh, interruption of polio virus transmission. Um, in the majority of countries worldwide, there's been a handful that have um, achieved eradication by using only the inactivated vaccine. I think that the issue about maintaining commitment of staff is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, actually, as I talk to people worldwide or, or I, I, I mention that I'm working on polio eradication, I, I get uh, no lack of interest in people saying, oh, that's amazing uh, that you have this opportunity to be involved in it. I actually, uh, as a medical student uh, in the late 1980s, when I heard about smallpox eradication and they were uh, starting a polio eradication initiative, it was actually uh, uh, how I set out my career path to be involved in polio eradication eventually. 
Uh, I took some detours along the way and actually um, uh, then started working in Africa around 2003, working on, uh, I actually went to Africa as a measles officer because I thought it was too late that I didn't have a chance to work on polio. Uh, uh, as it turns out, I had an opportunity to work on polio not only in Ethiopia, but in Nepal, which was my next duty station because we had an importation from India, and a vaccine-derived polio virus in Laos when I was in the Western Pacific. So um, we're not done with polio. I think it, it just shows us that, that there are still challenges. I think that uh, with, any, uh, with the two current eradication efforts that are um, endorsed by the World Health Assembly with the guinea worm and polio eradication, both have encountered uh, obstacles at the end. We're sort of neck and neck. I think we both had 22 cases in 2017, so we're <laughs> fighting it out to see who will be first in this 30-year uh, race to achieve yeah. eradication. And then just to address the comment that uh, Robert um, made, I think that you know, working in the field, I think that we were really clear from the beginning that you know, four tenets of polio eradication, that uh, one of those pillars was routine immunization, that that was, uh, part, of, uh, that was part of the strategy all along to achieve uh, interruption of polio virus. Um, and uh, in the countries where I worked, um, I really saw the, the, the benefits of those assets not trying to diminish at all the, uh, the amazing contributions of the investments from USAID uh, because you know, I benefited a lot working in WHO and, and uh, working with colleagues who were supported by the, the funding from USAID. So I'm just, I, I hope, um, I, I, do you don't mind me putting you on the spot? Because I think it was a great question about the inspiration for the staff, and Rotary has done an amazing job, and to keep that momentum going. Because, I mean, if I want the staff of the organizations are motivated, inspired, that bleeds into the, the external facing environment that we also face where we need inspiration. So really, they're the, the best ambassadors for the initiative when you have motivated staff working on the issue, but it is incredibly difficult every day, you know, sort of slogging through in this really challenging time. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Mike, like how, what, what's, how does Rotary keep at it? What's the inspiration that um, keeps everybody going? Yeah, thank you. I'm Mike McGovern, uh, the chair of uh, Rotary International's Polio Plus. Uh, committee and to try to lead our efforts with, with polio eradication. We're very happy to support this. We've been happy to support it for actually more than 30 years. Uh, the, the reason we do it is because of the kids. Uh, you know, I think that goes without saying it's what motivates Rotarians. Uh, I think this week we've reached the point that through Rotary sources alone, we have invested $1 billion uh, since this began. We, we also get matching funds from the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have committed to us $985 million. Yeah. We, we, we'd like to get this done, but we don't, want, we don't want to rush it for the purpose of getting it done. We want to make sure that we have a polio-free world and we sustain that polio-free world. You know, just in the last year, between Rotary's money and the monies that Gates gives us that we then reinvested in the system, we're committing over two years, 300 million dollars. So, you know, even though, you know, I've said very uh, high numbers in my book, uh, at the same time, the commitment is just as strong now as it was 30 years ago. Rotarians out of their own pockets have given over 50 million dollars uh, this year to the eradication of polio. Recently, in fact, at Will's suggestion, we, we went back uh, to the board of Rotary International and to our foundation board and said, you know, we're going to need to keep at this for 10 years. We, we need to make sure we sustain a polio-free world. We want to make sure we have the integration that's necessary to strengthen health systems, to, to improve routine immunization. And the Rotary Board has committed to an additional 10 years of advocacy. Uh, for, for us, that, that involves about a million dollar a year investment. It's, it's hiring advocates on Capitol Hill, not only uh, here in, in Washington, but also in other governments around the world. It involves Rotarians continuing to serve on committees, uh, and we look forward to continuing to support USAID, to continuing to support uh, the CDC, uh, because they have excellent staffs. Uh, they, they're, they're out there, they're in, they're in the front lines, and most of all, they believe, as we've heard, 
in working with local communities. Uh, because without the support of the local communities, mm -hmm. the community-based vaccinators, the leaders of governments and health councils in local areas, and the, and the work of Rotarians as well in those local areas, we don't get this done. So we are, we're behind this, we're going to continue to be behind it, and we strongly believe that this isn't just about the elimination or stoppage of the, the, wild, the circulation of wild polio virus, it's also about what we call polio plus. It's helping out in all these other areas as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. So maybe, I mean, it, what I picked up out of that was actually, frankly, a tactic of keeping the inspiration moving. And as some of the discussions we had last night is, you know, given that we're in this difficult stage and polio isn't going to be eradicated with wild polio virus and that whole discussion and vaccine drive and all of that, it gets complicated. So, you know, technically we sort of go down that road and say it's complicated, it's complicated, but to the public, they don't necessarily want to hear that, right? So is it as, I wouldn't say easy, because it's certainly not easy, but is it as explicit as just being honest with our organizations and the public and saying, look, it's gonna be at least another 10 years, we need to have that commitment and just set that as the frame, and then you have that commitment going forward. So you know, it's something to reflect on of rather than saying, you know, the press is gonna pick up that it's not wild polio and all of that, just saying it's going to take 10, 15 years, we need to sort of reassess commitment and to, to have that as an ask for all of our organizations. And I think that's a great example of what Rotary did. I mean, there is an example of how to inspire people to keep going in the long, uh, the long haul. Um, we have about five minutes left. So I'm going to just ask for maybe one or two more questions and then we'll close. Yes, please. Uh, good morning, Lee Losey with the Core Group Polio Project. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I was really heartened by Senator McConnell's uh, commitment not only to polio but to international aid. That's, that's great to hear from somebody in his uh, position. And uh, many thanks to USAID uh, for their longstanding support to polio and in particular to the core group, group of NGOs, about 50 different NGOs supporting that. More of a comment maybe than a question on that side is one piece of that that I think is so important as we have so many critical partners, CDC, Rotary International, Gates Foundation, uh, UN agencies working on polio, there are people at a lot of different levels and we need all of those partners. And what the NGOs bring, I think, critically in many cases is that connection to the community level. They get right down there at the community level and they know what's going on so that they're actually, you know, with the mothers, with the children, so they know what's happening and they're able to both communicate and, and find cases. So I think that's so critical. Uh, Will, you know, a question, as I keep thinking about this communications conundrum, could we get our, put our heads around changing the name from CVDP, you know, circulating vaccine-derived polio, to mutated polio virus or, or something else? I, I, it seems to me that that is a real communication challenge, yeah. and I wonder if we couldn't yeah. figure out a, another name for that, because I, I, I think it's a misnomer. As you explained it, that it's, it's not, strictly speaking, just vaccine-derived. It's a mutated thing. So maybe we could change the name. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, back here. I'm, <coughs> I'm Henry Perry from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, one of the important lessons from the polio eradication experience so far and Irene alluded to this, and I guess Lee to a certain extent, but the lessons that we've learned in reaching out to communities uh, where if, uh, persistent polio transmission has continued, and the methodology for doing that in a collaborative way that uh, is engaging and gives community ownership, as we've mentioned. Uh, the lessons learned in doing this are critically important, not only for polio, but for many other uh, important global health priorities. And so, uh, one of my questions, I have two questions that are related, but one of my questions is how can we build on the experience that the NGO community has had, UNICEF has had, in reaching out in these very difficult places where polio transmission was not interrupted? How can we learn from that and apply that to other global health priorities, not only for immunizations, but for other critical issues where we know that uh, 
with very simple technologies and low cost interventions, we can save a lot of lives. We're moving towards the ending preventable child and maternal deaths uh, campaign. And this, these lessons, I think, are terribly important for that that go far beyond immunizations. The other related comment and question I have is uh, one of the lessons from the polio eradication experience and was also true in the smallpox eradication experience was the feeling that people in communities had who had been neglected where transmission was continuing uh, of resistance because uh, why are people coming to us for this problem which is not a priority for us where uh, when all of our other problems have been totally neglected by the government and the rest of civil society. And there has been experience that Gates has funded through the core group polio project of building in a broader set of services for these very marginalized high risk communities. And how can we build on that as well to extend this experience okay. in the very high risk marginalized communities that are should be our priorities in global health. Okay, great, thanks. So those will be the final two questions. And so just if you wanna uh, close out with those comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe just uh, taking the questions, I think that we do have a couple of communication challenges. I think that uh, uh, circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus is not only a mouthful, but it's also a communication challenge. Probably, I, I like your suggestion. I think that we should uh, think about how we communicate that out. I think we, we need to talk about how, pol how we communicate polio transition. And maybe it was suggested at the Regional Immunization Technical Advisory Group uh, last week in uh, Rwanda that maybe we shouldn't talk about polio transition, but talk about polio integration, really talk talking about how we're integrating polio vaccination, polio surveillance into broader disease prevention activities. And I think that the, the, the second questions actually are, are, um, are closely related to that. I think that those um, immunization activities, I think that we've tried to do it in the up to now with using the opportunity of immunization activities to provide broader services like vitamin A distribution or bed net distribution or uh, anti-helminthics for uh, deworming um, through those uh, disease control efforts. But I think that really, you know, all of those efforts that we're talking about polio integration, if we're, if we're strengthening a robust, sustainable immunization program, we're going to provide so many services uh, that are going to prevent uh, uh, child and maternal mortality uh, because it encourages health facility-based delivery where we can give not only a birth dose of polio but a birth dose of BCG um, and a birth dose of hepatitis B and, uh, and then throughout the lifespan that we're providing life-saving vaccines at every point along uh, that continuum. Uh, so I, I do think that there's lots of opportunities and that's exactly where we're focusing on now. And when we're talking about moving our efforts to the uh, you know, big, most difficult countries where we want to start first is CDC. We've, we're working with partners to, and we've identified six countries where we're really focusing on. And those six countries include Pakistan and Nigeria, but along with that, four other countries, India, Indonesia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Ethiopia, that represent 50% of uh, unvaccinated children and 75% of um, measles mortality. And so we really want to put our efforts in those areas where a lot of children are dying, where it can make a big difference in uh, child and maternal mortality. Okay, all right. And just one last quick up. thing to add sure. on to Will, um, and about your point about getting the lessons learned. And I, I think that's a really important mm -hmm. point in doing more both documentation, getting out the stories, getting out the experience, particularly of all of the elements of polio, I think is really, really important. I think forums like these is really important to do that but there's a, getting it out into the literature, getting it out into publications would be also a really important thing to do. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, there's, it's hard to sum up. This has been a great discussion and it's obvious <laughs> that it's been really, uh, forums like this are great to move us along. Ideas are generated. We know that there's communication challenges. This idea of, you know, Rotary calling out, like, you know, it's gonna take 10 years being realistic about it. So I think in this whole effort of the polio eradication and ensuring that the assets are used towards bettering people's health in other areas. If we can think of it in terms of what I've heard as two themes today is we need to be vigilant in our actions and inspirational in our efforts to get it done, but also to ensure a polio free world. And that would be a great gift for the future generations and the billions who will come after us on this planet. So I wanna take the time to say thank you very much for our panelists and if we can give them a round of applause. So 
we have about a 10 minute break now. There's um, refreshments and coffee outside and if we could reconvene in here at 1040. Thank you.
their seats. We're going to get started. Please take your seats. Good afternoon and welcome to the second half of our program. I'm Nellie Bristol, Senior Fellow at the Global Health Policy Center and I head up our polio eradication work here. Um, we have a video message to show you from Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO. WHO has been a critical partner to polio eradication and he sends this message from Geneva. a disease that has afflicted humans for millennia. We have come so far, but we know that the last mile is the most difficult. Some countries have gaps in service delivery and virus surveillance. Insecurity and instability make a hard task even harder. The process of eradicating polio has taught us many, many lessons. This include how to find, vaccinate, and protect the most vulnerable communities, and how to prevent the spread of disease within countries and across borders. So our, this is our next panel, and we were going to talk about, um, we're going to explore innovative approaches to reaching mobile refugee and migrant populations. With its mandate to immunize children worldwide against polio, the GPEI has worked in a range of remote, challenging, and occasionally dangerous locales, sometimes with people who have never received health care of any kind. Through this process, the initiative has developed new methods of operating that could lead to permanent health care access solutions to these most disaffected populations. To explore some of these innovations, we will hear first from John Vertefe, Polio Eradication Branch Chief at, Chief at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He will be followed by Ahmed Arale, uh, Secretariat Director for Kenya Somalia Core Group Polio Project, and then by Andrew Etzeno, Immunization Advisor for Health and Complex Settings Unit for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Each will give a brief opening statement I will ask them a couple of questions, and then we'll open up to the audience. John, you want to start? Sure, thanks. Uh, the mic is okay. Um, great, so it's a pleasure to be no, it's not working. Here, here. Here. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank CSIS for organizing this event. Um, 
so on this topic, I think where I'll stop is that we come from the point of view um, at CDC and in GPI that every child in the world should have access to the polio vaccine. Um, and, and as we think about access, particularly access in very difficult places where disrupted systems have been put in place or there is civil strife or uh, war, uh, we, th we come at it from the angle of trying to get access to that child and to give every opportunity for the program to deliver that vaccine, the child to receive the vaccine, and to remain polio free. We're on this last mile, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but this last mile is a complicated mile in polio. Uh, it's extreme remoteness. It's not just terrorism, but it's terrorism. It's extreme remoteness. It's very fragile health systems. And how do we gain access to kids? The first thing, and probably the fundamental principle, and this came out a little bit this morning, was uh, community ownership of the issue. And in order to have success, we've seen time and time again, we have to engage community leaders, we have to engage the groups that are important to those communities, whether they're civil groups, whether they're religious groups, um, to gain access, to help them understand why this is important, why the problem is something they should be concerned about, and to identify local, locally constructed solutions that rely on local individuals to deliver these services. If we can achieve that, and when we can achieve that, kids get vaccinated at very high levels. If we fail to achieve that, the task of getting that vaccine in becomes exceedingly difficult. And that is on a gradient of how challenging the situation is. I'll talk to you about six key strategies that we use, in, in, and we don't use all of these strategies all the time because the situations are sometimes very different. The situation in DRC uh, with our circulating vaccine-derived polio outbreak response right now is very different than the situation was in Syria when we were responding there. Um, it's very different, very different than in Afghanistan and Pakistan in some instances, and in Borno in Nigeria. But there are some key lessons that we learn in each of these instances that help us push the vaccine further and closer to the children. The first is um, we have amazing technologies available to us. And so we can do, uh, use satellites to do intensive mapping exercises. This is something that we've done in Borno, uh, where we've looked at uh, images before and after um, uh, events in that state, uh, military events in that state, or Boko Haram events in that state, to understand where the population had moved to, where structures had been damaged, where they were repaired, whether there was grass growing on the roads, uh, whether there wasn't, all in an effort to understand better from the sky where does the population reside? And with that information, the teams on the ground that are so critical to getting this work done can target their efforts towards the places where we believe there are kids. The second example I'll give is readiness and preparedness and the ability to deliver uh, multiple doses of vaccine in a very short time period. Um, because these situations are very fluid, uh, when you have complex humanitarian emergencies, you really want to make sure that when you can get in, you get in. Not the next week, not the next month, not the next year. When you can get in, you get in. Uh, so there are a lot of strategies that we focus on. How do we best prepare the teams on the ground to be ready to go when they gain access? And how are they having uh, information lines and communication lines open in ways that they can gain that access and then deliver vaccine preferably more than one dose in a very short interval, in less than two weeks. Uh, Dr. Shano may talk a little bit about this because when he was uh, leading the polio program in Nigeria, they used this strategy a lot in, in Borno and Yobe states, and it gained access to vaccinate kids in a very big way. The third is related to my first fundamental point. Use locals to vaccinate. Uh, don't in international teams that come in, I've gone on many polio campaigns, as you can imagine, many of you in the room may have. Uh, it's a really important endeavor that internationals come in and help understand what is happening, help be able to document uh, and identify what the program's strengths and weaknesses and to guide the program. But this comes back to locals. Uh, in Pakistan, this is been a really critical issue. In northern Nigeria, this was a really critical issue. And almost everywhere, this is a really critical issue. Get your local communities and 
preferably, if, if, if in most instances where this is possible, um, get local uh, women to engage and be your front line. Uh, they're trusted in the communities. Uh, they have access to the houses. They know the people. This is their community and extended family. And they do a really great job of delivering that vaccine. But at a minimum, make sure you have locals doing that work. Community-based surveillance is another key point. And sometimes we don't have access. And in Afghanistan, as a great example, about 50% of the country geographically is not always under the direct control of the government. And so you often can get access to do part of the work, but sometimes can't get access to do all of the work. And so they may, uh, in some places, they may give you permission to go in and vaccinate, but they may not want you to monitor. Um, in, uh, in Syria, it was a similar, very complicated set of negotiations uh, to get into the places that needed to be gotten into and to get the vaccine in and to do the monitoring and make sure that the, the surveillance was coming out. Well, Afghanistan has, had, has done, and, and Somalia as well, they've both done fabulous jobs of setting up these very intensive community surveillance networks where people don't have to go in to do the surveillance, but there are community uh, volunteers whose, whose responsibility is to identify if there are paralytic kids uh, in their community and report back to the system. So this extends the, this extends the surveillance system from the facility-based formal surveillance system to this formal community-based surveillance that gives us a really important additional piece of information that we might have otherwise lost. Uh, two more. Um, engagement with service forces. And this is a really uh, absolutely has to be a local issue dealt with by the national government. Uh, it doesn't work everywhere, and it really has to be the government guiding uh, when and how you might engage um, uh, service forces to participate in polio vaccination. So as an example, uh, in Pakistan, um, the, uh, the military is very involved in providing security forces for vaccinators where there's been violence previously. They, they sit at the EOC, they are part of the process, and they engage as part of the program as defined by the government. Uh, in Northeast Nigeria, um, the uh, army uh, will vaccinate uh, for polio. And so if they gain access, uh, this was a decision made by the national program that if the army is able to move forward into a new space that has not been ac accessed previously, uh, that one of the things they attempt to do is to deliver polio vaccine there. Again, under that principle that every child should have access to this vaccine. And finally, permanent transit teams. Sometimes, and, and I think that there's been this constant, um, long time discussion about uh, the routine immunization systems and the uh, polio campaigns, which, which tend to be a lot of the focus on the work in many of the countries. Um, in some places, we know that the campaigns alone won't get every child. Um, and so in certain instances, uh, like for example in Afghanistan, uh, they've set up permanent transit teams where they try and have, they have a very rapidly moving population and they set up these teams to be able to vaccinate people on the move uh, to give every opportunity for the child to vaccinate. And in Pakistan, they have a, a, a slightly different program of community-based vaccinators that they also have permanent transit teams, but they have a, a slightly different uh, uh, program of community-based vaccinators that will vaccinate not only during the rounds, but also in between the rounds. Uh, and this, again, presents opportunities in those highest risk places to reach kids who might otherwise be missed. So those are some of the, the general tools that we have to access very difficult populations to access. Uh, they aren't perfect. We learn about them every day. We actually refine them very regularly. Um, and we are always open to new ideas. So if you have any, please let me know. Thanks. Thanks, John. That was a great overview. Um, so Ahmed works in the Horn of Africa, where there are many challenges, and he's going to tell us about some of those and some of the solutions. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, sometimes uh, we have uh, frontline uh, polio workers or health workers, who sometimes we need to bring their voices here. So I regard myself as a voice from the field. All those health workers, polio workers, who work in very difficult situations to ensure that no child is missed. 
or go the last mile. Uh, Horn of Africa is an epidemiological block, and they have the same characteristics. Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan. They are conflict prone. Uh, they have one of the most frequent mobile populations, that is the nomadic pastoralist. We have uh, conflicts that are ongoing, uh, insurgents. We have uh, tribal conflicts. So co-group polio project works in the most difficult areas of these countries, the Horn of Africa countries, especially the border areas. They are highly insecure. Even the governments will not want to go and give out services there because of insecurity. They are castle wrestling. Uh, they are armed non-state actors who operate in these border areas. And really, it is very difficult. So uh, co-group polio project, the NGO partners who work there have over the years created a lot of trust with these communities. And, and I'm here today to share with you what it is to work in the border areas of Kenya-Somalia border, Kenya-Ethiopia or Somalia-Ethiopia border, Kenya-South Sudan border, where sometimes you take an outreach to the nomadic communities or the mobile populations there, and then you are told, your com community informers tell you, wait, there's something happening. And then all of a sudden you are told there was an, uh, an idea explosion, uh, maybe soldiers on patrol were killed, and really that is the difficult places we work. However, for you to work in these difficult areas, you have to be very innovative. Otherwise, you will never operate or uh, immunize children. Uh, in this great forum, I heard about why we are not strengthening routine immunization. I'm here to tell you that with polio funding, a lot is happening. Without polio funds, nomadic communities will not get immunization. All the, all the antigens because they are not attended to by the conventional uh, health system. They are mobile. So co-group polio project and your partners have done several innovative uh, approaches. And as alluded by the former speaker, engaging communities. We have a robust community-based disease surveillance. In Horn of Africa, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, Ethiopia, we have 17,000 trained community health volunteers. And some of them were recruited from the nomadic communities so that they can be part of the nomads. They are with them wherever they move. And nomads look after water and pasture for the animals. That is their priority number one. Hence, others, immunization, and even health checking is secondary. So we have trained these community health volunteers to be part of their own you know, communities, the, the, the mobile communities, nomadic pastoralists. So what we do is we train them. We have given some of them uh, smartphones, as my colleague has said, where they even report on, on some of these things. So what happens is that we don't, this is polio money, we use polio money to do polio work. But when you go to these communities, they have never seen any other health services. They want uh, all the other antigens administered. You can't go with them, go to them with only vaccines. They will need other services too, maternal and other child health services. So we have to be innovative. We have to integrate. We have to give them integrated services. And we even go further 
and work with veterinary services and partners who work in veterinary services to integrate livestock and human uh, outreaches so that you can uh, go to them and, and give them these services. One of the things we do is that using the community volunteers, community elders, religious leaders, we have mapped these communities. And for you to understand the dynamic nature of the high-risk mobile population in Horn of Africa, you have to work with these key people to map them, map their migratory uh, routes, their watering points. We have a situation whereby, like in Turkana, Kenya, which is predominantly nomadic population, we, the NGOs that we work with have put container clinics in the migratory routes so that you know nomads are moving to this side for pasture and water. You want to have a clinic that will uh, serve them in, in terms of immunization and uh, other health services. And the same case with the, the cross-border. As I said earlier, there's frequent movement of mobile population in Horn of Africa. And one of the things is they are underserved, they have low immunity, which is a receipt for heightened risk of infectious diseases. As we work in the polio, our community volunteers even report zoonotic diseases. In the areas we come from, there are Rift Valley fever currently, there's an outbreak of Rift Valley fever, dengue fever, chikungunya, and many of these diseases. These are people who are moved with the animals, and we are, we are not only afraid of polio only. So community-based uh, disease surveillance is one uh, approach that has really worked for us. And without the community engagement, we will have never been in those uh, risky areas. The other approach was cross-border health initiative. After the huge outbreak of polio in Horn of Africa in 2013, uh, there was ad hoc meetings of cross-border collaborations because this is a regional problem. Uh, countries will want to collaborate and coordinate these efforts. So what core group did was to now work on a institutionalized uh, cross-border health initiative that created committees along all the borders in Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. And these committees will comprise of the local border authorities, immigration, security agencies, uh, agencies and elders, religious leaders, who will be at the front line to sensitize and do social mobilization on diseases that transit uh, borders. And we have taken this to the next stage of holding regional uh, cross-border forums, even at high level where countries will meet, and this really has sensitized uh, the countries on the dangers of polio outbreak or even diseases that will transcend their borders. And those two approaches have been taken to the next level. We are currently in discussion with the Intergovernmental Authority of Development, IGAD, it is an eight country block in Horn of Africa. And tell them that we want to harmonize, you know, detection, reporting across the borders so that we have facilities that are talking to each other from across the borders that have do the same documentation. We want to vaccinate and document the, the, the children on the move and ensure that if they have missed service on the other side, they don't miss it across the border on the other side. We have situations whereby teams cross from one country to the other to just follow these uh, uh, you know, mobile populations to vaccinate them. As you are aware, Somalia has very weak government. The border areas, some are completely inaccessible because they are under the control of uh, non-state actors. We have situations whereby 
our teams will wait children to come out of that region so that they can be vaccinated. Without polio funding, I don't think whether uh, the high risk mobile populations who have low immunity will get the services they are currently getting. When we go to a household, a nomadic household, we only don't talk about polio. You have to tell them about other key, uh, you know, family health practices, maternal health, breastfeeding, young child infant feeding practices, and many other issues. So I think it's very important that we really look at this. When, when people talk about uh, transition planning, to us in the field, we really get worried. We say, what will happen to all these areas, all these communities that are being served through this polio funding? Thank you. Thanks so much. OK, so Andrew. Um, Andrew Etino, who <laughs> had a difficult flight here and arrived just in time this morning. Uh, looking very much forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, for the polio program, uh, globally, we've made significant progress right from 1988 up to now. Uh, we make significant success by the global uh, polio uh, partners. Uh, at the stage we are now, we have not yet finished the job. We need to sustain the momentum until we are 100% sure that we'll finish the job. Uh, presently, the polio is boxed into uh, the few sanctuaries called the polio reservoirs in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. So these reservoirs, they have some peculiarities that we must take into consideration if we must finish the job. Number one is program performance. We, look, we need to look at the program performance in each of these sanctuaries. Are we making significant progress? Number two is access. So the virus is hibernating or hiding in areas of insecurity in those areas. And thirdly, the mobile population. People are moving with the virus and circulating the virus to susceptible individuals. The government of Afghanistan approached the International Federation of the Red Cross sometime back in 2016 to support in areas of insecurity where they cannot have access to the children that are under the control of anti-government elements. So the Federation approached CDC for support, funding support. We were able to get funding and to start the pilot in the eastern region of Nangaha and uh, uh, Kandahar and Kunduz. So in the eastern region, where we had the ban on polio, as at that time, between 2016 and 2015, we started with four provinces in Nangaha and eight uh, sorry, four districts in Nangaha and four, eight districts in Kona. We mobilized the Red Crescent Society after the cooperative agreement was signed between the Federation and uh, CDC. We also had to sign an agreement with the National Society, which is the Afghan Red Crescent Society. The Afghan Red Crescent Society entered into an MOU with the Ministry of Public Health in Afghanistan. So we need to take into consideration the local actors who should lead in these areas. We need to plan with the local actors to have significant success in these areas. When we started the project, 
we have to discuss and dialogue with the local actors. By this, I refer to the anti-government elements in these areas. And there are different groups of anti-government. There are splinter groups. We discuss with the Taliban. We have the Daesh controlling some areas. The, the Taliban were more receptive to our discussion and were able to hold uh, several community dialogues with the anti-government elements, negotiate for access. Based on the seven principles of the Red Cross, which includes impartiality, neutrality, and independence. The trust was there and we were given access to commence community vaccination in these uh, areas. We started with two strategies, which include house to house in Nangaha and Kuna. The second strategy was the use of health camp strategy. And this is an integrated uh, health services, not just polio now as a standalone program, but integrated with other services, taking into consideration the health needs of the community. And this was more rewarding, providing more demand creation activities in those communities. Because most of the population we are dealing with here in this area, their health services have been destroyed. There are no health services in these areas. So they are devastated, they are traumatized, they lack basic needs and even food, where to sleep and all that. So we took into consideration the community needs and it was very attractive. The Afghan Recreation Society and the Federation supplied uh, medicines. There was free consultation. And we set up these head camps in the communities based on the baseline assessment that was done in those areas. And through these strategies, we were able to reach a significant number of children. Some of them, at the start of the project, for five years, they've not been vaccinated. Some of them were zero dose. You know. So it was significant incursion into those areas that were under the uh, 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 protection of the militants and the anti-government elements. Now, for the program, we need to have a paradigm shift from what we've been doing if we must finish the job. The situation has changed, the factors have changed, and so many things have changed in the program. So we need to bring the program closer to the community by involving them in the planning of our uh, interventions in those areas. Local actors need to be involved in our planning. Right now, we need to allocate more resources to the community. This is the only way we can be able to get more results for the program. Because if you look at the mobile population, each round of exercise, each campaign, we have significant number of children that were missed and it's reported. 700, 500, 300 in these countries, including Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Simply because the children were not in somebody else's micro plan. But if you bring this micro plan to the community, the community knows the children that are traveling, they know where they are, they can locate them. Almost 90% uh, of community leaders, they use phones, they use internet and all that. So you can track these children wherever they are. They know where these children are located. So we need to go into micro innovation to ensure that the micro planning in the community is well developed. These children can be tracked and vaccinated in the community. So GPEI has made success. The question is, we have not finished the job, but who can finish the job? Are we using the right personnel to finish the job? Who are those that will finish the job? We should look for them. 
By that I mean local actors in, within the community. And we should deploy more resources to the local actors in the community so that they are empowered. The case in Pakistan, like they said, uh, Muhaviz, the frontline health workers in, Muhab, uh, in Pakistan that are doing community baseline uh, vaccination, they need to be empowered. We need more women. We need more resources. We need more incentives to attract the women into the program so that we don't have uh, attrition or dropout rate. And we mustn't forget that complacency is also setting into the program. So if complacency is setting in and we have not finished the job, then we are at the risk of removing our, pe our leg from the pedal and having reinfection, resurgence, and going back to square one, which is what we don't want. So in summary, I uh, want to say here that the GPI partners, the government of the United States, and CDC should continue the momentum until we finish the job. Innovative ideas should be taken into consideration so that we finish the job of a poly eradication. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So um, one of the criticisms of polio eradication is that it hasn't gotten other health services out there. And I, I want to talk about some of the individual um, technologies that you're using to get the other vaccines there. Polio eradication, polio drops can be, have to be frozen. They're in a box that's easy to carry. But how, what, how are you getting other vaccines to some of these populations, Ahmed? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as I said, uh, through polio funding, we take services to people who have not received services, especially the high-risk mobile populations, uh, mo mostly who are nomadic pastoralists. And, and when you look at their patterns of movement and where they go to, these are places that even vehicles cannot access. So what we do is we have outreaches that target these nomadic populations. Uh, the trade community uh, volunteer among the community will be giving us where these uh, communities are because we link them to the health facility. So when they tell us uh, these communities have come and shifted from across the border and came to this side, we tell the facility to now send in an outreach service. And what they use is a motorbike, because you can't access them uh, through a vehicle. Uh, so what we use is we have uh, vaccine carriers, call boxes that can be carried in a motorbike. And sometimes you, you see two motorbikes, uh, one to carry those items, and the other one to be used by the nurse. And uh, we have the community volunteer waiting and the other side to, to do that. So, and when we take these services, it's not only polio drops, you have to give all the other antigens. Mm -hmm. They are pregnant mothers there who need some antenatal uh, you know, services, and we have to have the nurse to do that, give also other services. Mm -hmm. So what we say is that these communities don't access, they don't go to the facilities, because their priorities, they're on the move. Mm -hmm. We have situations whereby we have a lot of fully immunized nomadic uh, children, courtesy of our project. Fully immunized, they have taken all the antigens. That means they have not been going to the facility, but we are going to them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. John, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, there are so many displaced people in the world today. Um, which of these innovations that the GPEI has come up with, where, how permanent can they be and how can they be used for the wide range of, of displaced people we have today. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I think you see it already. And I think that when I, th when I think about our polio program at CDC, there's, there's two parts of it, right? I mean, the first is that we are a formal part of CDC's structure uh, in, a, in, in what we call a branch, where we have permanent staff who are working on polio and many of them have been for long, 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 long time, decades, some of them. 
uh, and who uh, will continue to work on polio. But along with uh, the rest of the global community, we also activated our emergency, re uh, ur emergency response to polio several years ago. And so I wear this dual hat of the, the polio branch chief and my permanent position and the incident manager for the polio activation uh, for the emergency response. And I think what came with that was this focus on getting the things that you need, whether those things or I should say the things and the people that you need mm -hmm. to the places that they are needed and to pulling out all of the stops to doing that and to becoming operational in a way that is uh, very different than normal business and to become transparent and accountable in a way that is more assertive than normal business. Um, and I think that these are lessons that we uh, already in public health apply to other emergencies. Um, and, and, and so in our, in our CDC system, that emergency operations center, which is a pretty impressive place, is really a platform to deliver a countermeasure that is needed for whatever it's needed if it's an emergency global health response. So you can bet in the fall we'll be seeing hurricane watches come through there and potentially activations depending on how the hurricane season goes. Uh, if you're hearing about an event in the news uh, related to uh, an infectious disease somewhere else in the world, you can bet that we're watching that and that times will activate. And the technical expertise is brought into this operational platform that streamline, streamlines access to the director's office, access to resources, and the ability to, to engage with logisticians and other uh, folks that we don't sometimes think about as being the backdrop for delivering this incredible capacity. And through that, we move faster, we get places quicker, we get people to those places, and we're able to respond. And so uh, you see this uh, in that way very regularly. The other thing that I wanted to flag, though, is that other part that I said, more accountable and transparent. And I do believe that um, the polio program as a whole has become a very uh, accountable and transparent program. Every national program uh, that uh, has uh, large resources for polio has accountability measures and transparency measures built into their reporting systems in a way that is very detailed. Um, and, and when I say that, you think only about the money, but it's not always about the money. It's about spending the money well, right? And so uh, let's take an example of uh, delivering an SIA. If you're going to deliver an SIA in a place and you haven't gotten your money there on time and you haven't done your community awareness and you haven't selected your vaccinators and you haven't done your training and you haven't done your micro planning to know where the kids are and you haven't uh, frozen your freezer packs, how's that campaign going to go? It's going to be pretty bad. Um, some of these accountability measures are about setting timelines in advance of these rounds and checking in with these local teams to say, okay, have you gotten your resources? Are the resources there for you to be able to mobilize your workforce? Uh, if that has been done, great. Have you mobilized that workforce? Have you planned the trainings? Uh, what are the microplanning results? And do you know where your kids are, how you're going to distribute your vaccines? And you follow that for weeks in advance of these campaigns happening. And then you put in uh, monitoring processes during the campaigns to understand where you've reached, where you missed. Uh, if looking at the underlying causes as this campaign is unfolding about why you're missing those folks, engaging at the localest level possible uh, leaders to correctively engage those communities that aren't vaccinating or have problems. Uh, and then you report out at the end and you take that information and you use it to refine and hone your next process. And that's where I think polio has a lot to offer to uh, uh, global health development, to public health improvement in countries that have fragile health systems. I spent most of, uh, well, I guess it's not most of my career anymore. I spent the early part of my career, <laughs> uh, about a decade overseas running offices in, in pretty complicated places, Nigeria and Tanzania and post-earthquake Haiti. And I can tell you that in each of these places, you have these very broken systems. Um, but when you start applying accountability measures and operational approaches that aim to deliver that was 
which was typically planned very thoughtfully, but not able to be delivered, you change results. Uh, and we can do that on specific things. If we can apply that more broadly, we can actually engage in a whole range of things in a better way. So, but your accountability mechanisms, they're, they're based on a campaign approach to, to uh, vaccination. How do you tweak that so that, you, so that it can support routine immunizations? Well, in fact, so in Nigeria, we did that with the government of Nigeria. And so um, when Dr. Ashano was leading the polio program, we very much uh, were focused through his EOC on setting up these, these um, dashboards that would sort of monitor the preparedness and the results of campaigns, uh, places that had performed poorly over long periods of time, and then intensively sending uh, special teams out there to address those issues with those communities. Um, through a uh, collaboration um, with USAID, with the Gates Foundation, with CDC, and most importantly with the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency in Nigeria and WHO as well, um, we've been able to apply that same kind of dashboard and electronic reporting system for routine immunization services. And we had uh, planned to do that in a pilot state um, three years ago and roll out to a few other states, but in fact, we've hit a national level. And so there's a national reporting system uh, that feeds into over, I forget the exact number, but it's over 25,000 reporting sites, health facilities that are doing routine, routine immunization. And any manager uh, up in that system can go and immediately see those results uh, in the electronic system and look at the dashboards and understand where there are problems. I don't know if you. Yeah. Have more to say, Dr. Chair. Yeah, uh, uh, John is right. The one of the transformative tool that really changed the polio program for the past uh, five years is the creation of the emergency operations center. And when the World Health Assembly declared polio as a programmatic emergency, you know the political leaders in the country became very active and put polio on the front burner. They committed resources and committed most of the uh, sub-regional office political leaders into the program. And the fact that the accountability framework, which was also part of the EOC tool, to hold people accountable, both political leaders, technical officers, across board, government and partner agencies, was something that was really very used in uh, Nigeria. People were held accountable. I, I could recall uh, a governor telling a local uh, government chairman that if there is polo in your district, if a child is paralyzed, then I will paralyze you politically. So these are some of the things that made them sit at EOC meetings, sit at evening review meetings, to listen to feedbacks from the community and all that. So accountability framework is something that really worked and a lot of dead wood were eased out of the system. Complacency was eased out of the system also. And uh, uh, the best hands were deployed to worst performing districts in those areas. The use of the dashboard also, which is also part of the accountability framework, was to monitor the pre-campaign indicators in, ter in terms of state of preparedness, fund released by local government, state government, some of them released fund after the campaign and all that. So these are tools that were put in place. Communication fund, when did it arrive? Fund for movement of vaccine logistics. All these are timed and programs. And they are scored. Uh, you see green and red colors showing that you did not meet state of preparedness, and in such a situation, the exercise will be canceled or suspended in your districts, and there are consequences for such action. So everybody, and the use of GIS and GPS, we also use that. We have better maps were drawn, rather than hand-drawn maps. Uh, vaccinators were tracked, and we download it into the computer and look at their movement, it may not tell you whether the vaccine entered my body. It shows the distribution in the community, whether they are sitting under the tree and just giving false data and all that. 
So these are some of the innovations that were brought in to them. And um, the fact that you have structures like the political leader structure, the presidential tax force, that were really uh, having strong oversight over the, the program. Most of the programs don't have that. But this is something that was created by the polio program. You have the tag uh, structure, you have the ERC structure, and globally you have the independent monitoring board, which was non-aligned, was straightforward, and giving uh, advice to the programs for new things to happen. Okay, thank you very much. John, did you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, I just want to flag one other thing, because I don't want it to all be about the data. It's also about um, what the people are doing and how people are spending their time. Uh, and um, you know, one other example that, that CDC has been engaged in in Nigeria is um, what are you doing when you don't have rounds with, this, um, with the polio workforce? And so uh, we actually sort of modeled off a combination of our international stop transmission of polio program and, uh, and a start program um, from, uh, uh, from another country, from an individual country, I think it was Uganda, um, slip, slipping my mind at the moment. We actually framed the development of a, of a national stop program in Nigeria that now has about 250 uh, individuals who are full-time engaged um, and the way it works is that those individuals are, are placed within national, state, and predominantly local immunization teams. Um, and so uh, when there are campaigns going on and when there is active polio work happening, they are very actively engaged in all of that accountability and transparency, yeah. preparedness, and delivery of those services. When they're not, they're working on micro-planning and vaccine assessments and doing, doing a series of trainings as part of that local immunization team to build the constructs for a better routine immunization system. Um, we haven't had detection of polio in Nigeria uh, since 2016 and, and there in Borno and other places in Nigeria, we haven't uh, had detection since 2014. Uh, very, uh, very uh, much now, uh, they are increasingly engaged in some of these routine immunization services, engaging on measles and trying to deal with measles in a better way. And the, the country of Nigeria has declared uh, routine immunization a national emergency, and so they've been engaging on helping those efforts. And so this is a direct transfer of uh, the, the skill sets to the, 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 broadest, the broader sphere of what right. needs to happen. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, so questions. I'm going to take three questions at a time. Um, we'll start with this gentleman over here. Please wait for the microphone. Say who you are and be brief. Hi, this is Jahan from Afghanistan, and I'm also an intern at the Embassy of Afghanistan here. So uh, as you said, one of the challenges in Afghanistan to eradicate polio is accessing areas that are insecure and under some anti-government elements. I was wondering how successful the efforts has been to work with the local networks, communities, and even the anti-government elements to access those areas and advancing the vaccination campaign. Thank you so much. Balaki, over here. Um, thank you very much. I'm Falaki Alainka. I work with GSI on USID's Maternal Child Survivor Program. Uh, thank you for all the, um, uh, the points you made today. Um, just a few quick comments. Uh, one is looking really at that whole community engagement piece. I was really delighted that you all reiterated the fact that the, the polio eradication, um, um, the way we are implementing it has changed over time and recognizing that that community engagement is really, really critical to finishing the job. Yeah. And that, that means that this is going to require not just the, the polio vaccines, but also other services, including routine immunization, particularly in, in communities where they, have, they don't have access to any other services. So it's really heartwarming to hear that. Um, USID is, is funding some of our work in Madagascar and Burkina Faso looking at community-based surveillance, uh, not just for AFP, 
but for vaccine preventable diseases. And I wanted to hear more about how that community-based surveillance is actually looking not just for acute flaccid paralysis, but other important diseases that uh, affect the communities. Um, and part of the work is also looking at a one health approach. Uh, in Burkina Faso, for instance, it is working with the veterinary services and ensuring that that one health approach is, is being uh, promoted and embraced. And again, it's meeting the community needs. Um, I'll leave you with a question. And that is, uh, we know that in Nigeria, the job is not done. There are many places that are still very silent within the Lake Chad area. And as we speak, um, there are at least 100 islands that have, that have not been accessed uh, within the Lake Chad area, particularly on the Nigeria side. What are the plans to access these islands uh, within a reasonable time and to ensure that uh, essential services, including polio immunization, are, are delivered? Thank you. Um, we'll get Henry. And then we'll... Thank you. I'm Henry Perry again from Johns Hopkins. Uh, as I listen to the presentations, uh, I can't help but wonder about the potential, and I'd appreciate your comments on this, but the potential as we look towards the next 10 years of continued intensive surveillance for polio and how we can build that effort into a broader approach to addressing global health problems. Uh, how we can build on the experience and provide funding for maybe smaller pilot projects that could be scaled up in the sense of developing a basic package of services for these very underserved to high priority populations and monitoring their results, but also linking that with the surveillance component that uh, the core group has started on in terms of birth registration, but extending that um, into death registration uh, particularly for children and um, using verbal autopsies to determine cause of death and making that a community-led experience so that communities themselves are aware of who's dying, what they're dying from, and what the community itself could do to address those. Of course, immunization is important, but uh, there are many other conditions that are not vaccine preventable that communities can do a lot to address. So it's, in a sense, I'm following up on my earlier comment. Uh, but I think there's, there's a great potential here for doing some more innovative work that could have very um, intense uh, and, and important uh, contributions to broader global health problems that can derive from the polio experience as we move forward uh, in, in the next decade. Okay, thank you. So we have insecurity in Afghanistan, um, community-based surveillance, Lake Chad, and um, beyond vaccine preventable diseases. So, Ahmed, do you want to start? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, working with the communities, uh, what I didn't mention is that part of the key community actors that we mapped in our project areas were traditional healers. And many of them are religious leaders. Because anybody becomes sick or any child comes with any sickness, he will be taken for, uh, to the traditional healer or Quranic recitation. And uh, these are some of the groups, key members who we have sensitized. And when we do sensitization or trainings, we don't only tell them about polio. We tell them about all the other priority diseases. And to me, I feel that uh, to some extent, we have prepared the communities because we all work with their gatekeepers, elders, traditional leaders, uh, healers, uh, sheikhs, imams, because without them, we will not go into the community. So uh, to some extent, we have prepared these community members to detect and report any unusual happenings. Uh, currently, we get weekly reports from our uh, community volunteers. And, and we, when you see what they report, it doesn't ask on, on polio. Any other thing. Like the recent uh, outbreak of Rift Valley FIFA in one of our counties, Wajia County in Kenya, that was reported by a community volunteer. There was no health facility in that area. 
So the guy says, uh, animals are aborting, uh, animals are dying, and we have to send this to the disease uh, response unit, and they have to go in. So I think with the community-based uh, surveillance system and the cross-border health initiative, these are approaches that can be used for other diseases. We are already, to some extent, uh, reporting on these others, mm -hmm. even though our focus is uh, polio. These are systems that in the next few years, we can integrate other diseases, uh, zoonotic diseases or any other uh, diseases of adverse effect or that can transcend borders. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, for Afghanistan, um, you know, the national societies, the Afghan Red Crescent Society, has been working in the insecure areas, providing other services before polio was, program was integrated. Been providing community-based first aid programs and all that. So what we did was to ride on existing Afghan Red Crescent Society activities within those areas of insecurity. You have the mobile head team being used by Afghan Red Crescent Society in those uh, communities. You have the community-based uh, integration with other activities. So what we did when the program started was to engage and discuss with the community leaders. At the village level, you have the Malik. These are the community leaders. The next level, a group of Malik formed the Shuras. So we discussed the Malik with the Shuras. We have the grandmother committee because the, we recruited people from the community who can negotiate with them. So when they gave approval, especially from the Taliban side, we, we, we were able to get approval in some of this community. Then we also hired a security manager that interface with other security agencies. We do our security assessment. If the community is not secure, based on security feedback we get, we don't put the lives of our vaccinators and the volunteers at risk in those communities. So when they agree, we, we do that. So we have the security assessment. Though we lost a, a vaccinator in one of our encounter, but it wasn't, he wasn't targeted. A missile was fired across the border, and incidentally, he was doing post-campaign monitoring at that point in time, and it dropped there. And all those who were there were affected. Uh, the CDC uh, Bob Keegan Award was awarded to the family uh, for that. May he so rest in peace. So the program was successful in significantly by reaching children in those areas, basically because the Afghan Red Crescent Society, being a local actor, is accepted by the anti-government element as being neutral, impartial, and they are independent. So if it is otherwise, then you are going to have a problem. But on the other hand, for the Daesh, we couldn't make significant progress in areas controlled by the Daesh. So we continue to engage them, to discuss with them, but we couldn't make significant progress in those areas. But areas controlled by the Taliban were able to make significant progress. And we vaccinated a lot of children when we started the pilot. And we scaled up to uh, seven provinces, including Kunduz in the north. Now the epidemiology has shifted to the south. The EOC has recommended that we move to Kandahar. We have set up mobile team in Kandahar. We are vaccinating in Shawalinkut. We are vaccinating in uh, Sherabak and Catres, where we have the new virus now. So total virus in Afghanistan is nine, with six of them coming from the southern region and three in the eastern region. So the epidemiology has shifted from the east, where the Red Cross, our Red Crescent, played a significant role in Nangaha and Kuna province. And the 12 districts we worked, no virus has been reported so far in those 12 districts that was allocated to the Red Crescent Society by the MOPH. Okay. John, can you talk about Lake Chad? Lake Chad, sure. Um, I, I would like to 
could close on one thought on, on Afghanistan, and I thank you for, for being here today. Um, what has really been impressed on me in the engagements with the Afghan national program and the government, um, and I was last there in December, um, uh, the commitment that they have and also their shared view uh, of where I started uh, my comments earlier, that every child, regardless of where they are, should have access to polio vaccine. And the Afghan government really uh, shows remarkable uh, thought about this. If you can imagine that the country uh, has these anti-government elements taking up a lot of the geography that they're, they're trying to deal with on a security front, but they've taken the view and the commitment to polio eradication in that they uh, understand that those children are, uh, by nature of being in those places, should not be held accountable for the geopolitical issues going on, and that they sh should have access to vaccine. And that's a really important and incredible thing that makes the program possible in Afghanistan. Um, so to Lake Chad, um, I completely agree with your comment. Uh, we are not done uh, in uh, the Lake Chad region, uh, Nigeria and the surrounding four countries uh, that border Lake Chad. Um, we have several approaches that we use to try and gain access. Uh, some, all islands in Lake Chad are not equal in many ways. Um, some are accessible from uh, the Chad side, we've had little accessibility from the Nigerian side uh, because of the Boko Haram uh, stronghold there. Um, it's been uh, not uh, very good access from the Niger side, um, uh, but we have done a very good job of mapping them. And when I talked about the mapping earlier, uh, mapping them with an eye towards where are populations, uh, and when I talked about the maps earlier, I, what I didn't say was that we didn't stop at the mapping in that instance. And, and, and this is not possible everywhere, but it is actually possible uh, in, the Bor in the Borno situation uh, and the Lake Chad uh, situation. So in addition to the maps, we, each vaccinator who is part of the program is given a GPS device, and, and they, it tracks them uh, wherever they go to vaccinate. So we actually are able to document through the satellite imagery where the populations still reside, and then through the tracking exercises of vaccinators, whether zero up to seven, 10, 12 doses of vaccine have made it to a place. Uh, and what we found through doing that is that there has been constant, albeit very slow progress in some areas. Um, and that slow progress is not because there's not incredible work being done, it's because this is a place where we need to be persistent. And so uh, when we started uh, this push, um, there were an estimated uh, six to 700,000 children who were trapped uh, and now and not able to get services. And now that number has come down to around 105,000, uh, we believe, children who remain trapped and not having access to vaccine in the last several years um, because of that insurgency. And so all of those strategies that all of those strategies that I've talked about earlier are actually used in, in that setting with Lake Chad and the islands um, and, and the, even the, the non-island parts of that area. That is the readiness, that is the concepts of short interval additional doses, that is engagement of the security services, um, that is the, the mapping and access and, and very, uh, open lines of communication between the bigger security services and the program, the national programs in those five countries to make sure that when opportunities to access become available that they are not squandered and that you actually can get in and get a dose of vaccine into a community. But we still have to be persistent there and persevere. Okay, well unfortunately we have run out of time. Um, just a brief summary. So you've all said local engagement is the key. So uh, how, how do you keep that going? Um, uh, looking at the individual context in every area, every area is gonna be different. The, the community is gonna be different. The norms are gonna be different. So looking at that and um, 
you've built up these systems through polio money, and so how do we keep these things going? How do we keep this engagement going? How do we keep the cross-border types of um, initiatives going that you've talked about? Um, and there's a lot to do, but it sounds like there are some amazing innovations coming out, and that there's some, some really interesting things that can be applied elsewhere. So thank you to all our panelists. <laughs> Much appreciated. And now we're going to move into another video. As you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been an invaluable partner in the effort to eradicate polio, providing resources, technical assistance, advocacy, and leadership. We will now hear from Dr. Chris Elias, the Foundation's President of the Global Development Program. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. I want to provide an update on the priorities of GPI's partners this year. We continue to make incredible progress toward ending polio. And we believe that So we have um, a bit of a change in the program. Um, if you all want to go down and then um, we're going to do a little reshuffling here. Um, Dr. Redfield unfortunately had a family health emergency and so he couldn't attend today. But um, 
John Vertefe has graciously offered to help us out. He's going to, I guess, read his speech, right? So it will be the message from Dr. Redfield. Sort of. <laughs> and um, so, and Mike McGovern from Rotary had put together a, an introduction for Dr. Redfield, and he's gonna do that anyway because it, it talks about Dr. Redfield's experiences and what he has brought to CDC. So we're gonna go with, not to slight John, um, his full bio's in here too, but um, we're, we're gonna introduce Dr. Redfield, but then have John do the speech. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I, I seldom write out introductions. This time I did. <laughs> you know, I think we all wish the best to Dr. Redfield and his family, and sorry that he's not with us. You know, I, th this conference, which uh, the center has so graciously called, uh, you know, it's been terrific to hear all the different opinions and much appreciated. You know, it, it's, it's about sustaining U.S. support for polio eradication and, and what comes after that. You know, it, it's difficult to say when U.S. support began and it's even more difficult to say when it will end. Uh, I go back to my home state of Maine. 97 years ago, a young father came to our state, brought his wife and children along. He was looking to, to find a little bit cooler weather. He came to the coast. He went running through the woods, through the paths with his, with his kids. He went swimming in the very cold bay. And then, suddenly, he couldn't move his lower extremities. He was diagnosed with polio. He later went on to become president of the United States. He, he died, we all know, in 1945. And in 1946, the United States government decided to form an agency to deal with communic communicable diseases, which is now known as the Centers for Disease Control. That organization has worked on so many communicable diseases over the years, not least of which is polio. For the last 30 years, Rotary has been very pleased that they have one of the esteemed partners in this effort to eradicate polio. They've had very fine leaders over the years, including the current leader, Dr. Robert Redfield. Dr. Redfield is the 18th director of the CDC, I've had an opportunity to meet him a number of times. As, as Nellie and others mentioned, we had dinner with him last evening. Uh, he is extremely committed, extremely committed to not only the eradication of polio, but also sustaining a polio-free world thereafter. This comes from his experience, particularly in the HIV field, where he's one of the primary scientists and researchers over the times since the HIV uh, virus uh, was first discovered. He's bringing those resources, his skills, and his talents now to the eradication of polio. He does it with a very fine staff at the CDC. One of those is the substitute speaker, and I'm not going to embarrass Dr. Bertafe, John. I, I could, but I won't. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm on a lot of phone calls, and I go to what they call in-person meetings. Uh, of the senior leadership of the, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And one of the persons who is most listened to is John Vertefe. And it's not because you talk a lot, John. Uh, the, the reason we listen to John is he brings the expertise and the knowledge and the experience uh, that he's actually seen in, in so many different countries. He, he brings particular skills and information as a result of heading up the, what's called the EOMG, the Eradication and Outbreak Management Group. In, in that capacity, more than anyone else, he determines, or recommends, I should say, you know, where the resources are going to be spent of, of GPEI. He determines, working with the countries, uh, where we'll be investing monies in supplemental immunization activities, as well as in national immunization days. It's a very important response. We're, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Redfield as the leader of the CDC, Rebecca Martin, uh, who is, is also very involved with the CDC as the Center for Global Health, Will is the, the head of the Global Immunization Division, and then John, who was the polio lead for CDC. So please welcome again to the stage Dr. John Vertefe, the polio lead for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control.
Well, thanks, thanks so much, Mike. I'm sufficiently embarrassed by your, by your comments. Um, just a, a couple quick orders of business before I jump into this. Um, uh, first, Dr. Redfield really regrets that he, he could not be here today. Uh, he was with us last night and had to go off for a family emergency. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, I've known, I've known um, Dr. Redfield for about 15 years. I used to work with him uh, at the Institute of uh, Human Virology. Uh, and immediately upon coming into CDC, he expressed his, his sincere commitment and profound interest in seeing polio eradication happen and making sure that we do that and as we do it to think about the long game of how uh, we approach a responsible transition as part of that and also a complete eradication as part of that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, they gave me his speech but it isn't really a speech it's a series of talking points and and so I, uh, that means I have um, uh, considerable freedom to <laughs> as I go through to, to, to add commentary. Uh, but I do want to make sure I get through most of his uh, key points. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do then is to thank, uh, thank Mike for the introduction, both for Dr. Redfield and me. I uh, really appreciate it. I travel with Mike more than I travel with my family uh, around the world, so it's good to see you, Mike, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for participating today. Um, it's, uh, it's really, uh, the questions were spot on. The conversation has been great. I've really enjoyed sort of the, the, the process of uh, talking through this, so thank you CSIS for uh, putting it together. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the, the other uh, esteemed panelists who have done a great job in, in talking about uh, the incredible complexities of this very simple job of getting to zero. Um, uh, as Mike alluded to, uh, while we are fully engaged in uh, the polio fight, CDC uh, didn't just start this. Um, we've actually been in this game for quite a while. Uh, in fact, it was shortly after the agency was, uh, had become a U.S. government agency in the 50s that uh, a, a polio surveillance unit was established uh, to monitor the disease in the United States. In fact, uh, we have this uh, program called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, uh, which is uh, the outbreak uh, guys who you see going around the world stopping uh, diseases. Uh, and it was the, uh, the, the co-founder or the, the first head of that EIS program, um, Alex uh, Langmuir, who actually was the first head of the polio, or who set up the polio surveillance unit at CDC in the 50s. Um, our, Activities didn't stop there. We were engaged with Jonas Salk and his team uh, for the development of inactivated polio vaccine in the 50s, and then uh, engaged uh, with Albin's, Albert Sabin's team in the, in the early 60s in the development of oral polio vaccine. Uh, the, the surveillance unit and the epidemiology staff were very engaged in, uh, in helping with the field trials of those vaccines over um, the period that followed that. Um, and uh, in documenting uh, the declining uh, disease after vaccination, resulting in uh, elimination of polio from the United States in 1979. 1979, incidentally, I was about six years old then, so I wasn't doing all that stuff, but I joined the fight a little bit later. But it reminds us how long this journey has been, and I think that uh, over the course of the last two days, um, we've talked about um, the need to persevere and, and to take note of where we are, uh, but not to lose sight of the road in front of us. Um, we are on the verge of eradicating polio. Um, when you look at uh, 40 cases an hour in 1988, uh, 350,000 cases a year globally, um, to a dozen reported cases this year. Uh, that's an incredible uh, achievement, but it's not good enough. Uh, this last mile, as we talked about earlier, will be uh, an extremely complex mile. And while we're very close, we need to be very clear-eyed about that road ahead. I think it's also important to point out that as long as polio remains 
anywhere in the world, everyone is at risk. And so sometimes there's questions about, um, uh, you know, could what would happen if we didn't eradicate? That's no longer um, that's no longer a reasonable scenario. Uh, it's estimated that in uh, 10 years, if we just shifted to a control program, that you would see hundreds of thousands of cases a year. And so you don't go from uh, an investment uh, and the current level of investment to nothing. You actually go, if you were to decide not to eradicate, to a scenario of perpetually having to invest considerable sums of money to keep the whole world's population vaccinated because the, the virus was still there. So where are we today? Well, we've had 12 cases from two countries reported in 2018, um, three in Pakistan and nine in Afghanistan. Um, we haven't had a detection uh, since 2016 in Nigeria, but we have to be vigilant because, as I mentioned in the last talk, we have 106 thousand children that have not yet received vaccinations that they, polio vaccine that they need to ensure that they're protected. We also are dealing globally with several responses to vaccine-derived polio virus. And this has been an issue of considerable discussion of late. Um, it also is an issue that really uh, requires us to, to focus heavily on uh, recognizing in advance the places with these weak systems and taking preventative action to stop outbreaks. But where we are right now in the De Democratic Republic of Congo and the Horn of Africa, Horn of Africa including Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, um, in uh, Nigeria, in the Northwest, and Sokoto, we are actively engaged in outbreak response uh, for circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. So uh, how do we deal with that? Well, what it tells us is, um, in addition to closing down wild poliovirus, we also have to aggressively pursue vaccinating every child in these places, which have historically weak systems, uh, to ensure that we stop those outbreaks, but also protect them from future emergences of that vaccine-derived uh, vaccine uh, mutated polioviruses. Do, what do we get if we persevere? I think that's the next question. And uh, what we get is the opportunity to rid the world forever of a disease uh, that has affected uh, millions of people. Uh, that's only happened once before uh, with uh, a human disease, in smallpox. And uh, I imagine uh, that I've read some of the books on this, that that was not easy either. <laughs> Uh, and so we shouldn't expect that uh, this is going to be easy now, but it's absolutely worth doing. By doing it, we'll take a critical step towards improving the lives of the world's most vulnerable children. Uh, not only stopping the paralysis that affects the child, but also the impact uh, that it has on the care providers for that child and the burden that it has financially on society uh, related to that. Uh, you, you heard Senator McConnell this morning talking about uh, his uh, experience with polio early in his life and how uh, challenging that was. Imagine being able to take that off the table forever. So there are really four objectives that are going to be really critical in this uh, process uh, as we uh, go through the eradication process. The first is to keep the world polio free. We've got to interrupt virus. Uh, we've got to have sufficient visibility through surveillance systems, both AFP and environmental surveillance, for a minimum of three years uh, to be able uh, to certify. And we have to intensively do surveillance and outbreak response. Um, we have to uh, plan, prep, and vaccinate in advance of global OPV cessation. And then we will have to respond to any uh, subsequent outbreaks of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. To do that, we have to enhance the ability to de detect and respond. Uh, these outbreak responses are always high impact in terms of resources. Uh, they take up a lot of human capacity. I think we have a, uh, about a, there's 48 in the Horn of Africa alone, so there's probably over 100 and some staffing requests related to the ongoing circulating vaccine-derived outbreak. 
uh, responses right now. That's countries asking the global level to provide, or the regional level to provide staff to support them in their efforts in their countries. Um, but it's also financially very heavy. When uh, Nigeria had uh, the wild polio virus outbreaks um, uh, in uh, the early 2000s, 2003, 4, uh, that were exported to uh, 20 countries, Will was talking about that this morning, it cost about a half a billion dollars to actually respond to those outbreaks. Um, so we can do this better if we respond earlier. And so we have to actually, as we go through this process, enhance detection. And we can do this faster if we can make those first actions in the response more effective and quicker. So we have to get enhanced capacity for early detection, and we have to get enhanced capacity for rapid response. Uh, if we have those two things, these outbreaks will close very easily. If we don't have these two things, the outbreaks uh, can take quite a long time to close. Uh, we've been having a challenge as uh, in DRC getting in front of this outbreak response, and so actually we've all just come together and, and are working with the national government to retool uh, the footprint of that response right now um, because it was a bit um, it, it was a bit slow to start. The third thing that we have to do is to support and strengthen immunization services beyond polio. Um, you know, it's been mentioned a couple of times, like how do we predict where these things are going to be. The truth is that the places that we have these problems have been on lists for numerous years, um, lists that indicate that they are um, the places that are high risk and most, most likely to see these kinds of uh, emergence. And so we are pretty good, actually, at determining uh, the, the six or the ten countries that will be most relevant to this, and even subregions within those countries uh, that may be most relevant to making improvements. Where we have to step up our game is strengthening the ability of those countries to deliver vaccines, both through rut routine and supplemental um, services, uh, so that we can close those gaps before they become an emergent event or an outbreak. And finally, we should catalyze country efforts for elimination of measles and rubella. And the reason that this is important is that if you can improve access to measles vaccine, it means that you have improved the routine immunization system um, because the, the level of vaccination that would be required to deal with measles problems is quite high, even higher than polio. And so if you can imagine, if we can catalyze those efforts, what we're really, really catalyzing is a delivery system for any uh, countermeasure and any vaccine in particular, including inactivated polio vaccine. I wanted to talk for a moment about investments. The, uh, I've alluded to this already, but the investments in polio um, have been really cost effective. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that because we hear the big annual number, you know, whether this year the, the, the budget is about $943 million, I think is the, is the last digit there. Um, it's a large number. It's a big public health program. Uh, that gets you um, services and uh, surveillance in about 70 countries and, and vaccination services to 400 million kids a year in 60 countries. The return on that investment has already been apparent. Um, from inception to date, it's estimated that 18 million infections have been averted, uh, 18 million paralytic events have been inverted uh, on the basis of uh, the GPI uh, effort to eradicate polio. And that has resulted in $27 billion in cost savings to society um, through um, uh, disability uh, adjusted uh, costs and the, uh, the, the lack of ability of, to work uh, for care providers and uh, the individuals affected. It's also estimated that um, uh, the overall savings when we finish will be, to be between 40 and 50 billion dollars uh, for the first two decades that it's hard math to, to, to say this, but it started some years ago and would go through 30, 35, uh, 2035. Um, and so on the front end, we're already saving money, even though it's an, it's an expensive uh, annual cost. And on the back end, we will reap uh, far greater savings. So I think thinking about 
what we have to do, the first thing we have to do is we have to finish. Um, we have to keep our eye on the ball and not be distracted by other things and actually aim to eradicate polio. Uh, and as we eradicate polio, we also have to make sure that we are uh, effectively withdrawing oral polio vaccine uh, and um, that we are um, making sure that we don't see emergent uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses. We also have to transition responsibly. Um, and when we say transition responsibly, we mean all of those things we've been talking about today. How do you effectively improve uh, the um, delivery of vaccines in a public health system? How do you make a public health system, a national public health system, more accountable to get the resources that it's provided nationally or internationally to the people uh, and the services to the people that those resources were intended for? Uh, through these accountability and transparency measures. Um, it's, it's impossible for me to imagine uh, long-term a world with polio. Um, but what I don't want to imagine is uh, seeing those polio assets go away. Um, they have to be applied in a responsible way to other public health problems, and uh, particularly, I think, public health problems that impact children. So uh, as we talk about this transition a little bit, even though our eye is on the ball of eradication, uh, there's, there are really um, two objectives um, to protect the health, safety, and security of the world's population and of Americans. The first is keeping the world polio free. We do that by uh, continued vaccination and maintaining the stockpiles uh, for uh, quite a period of time after eradication, probably a minimum of 10 years. Those, those, the, those timelines will be recalibrated as we get closer. Uh, continued polio surveillance and actually enhancing surveillance, uh, particularly, I think, environmental surveillance we will see more of uh, in high-risk countries. We will continue to see very intensive uh, acute flaccid paralysis surveillance. Uh, and then, uh, as was suggested by the gentleman from Johns Hopkins, also looking very carefully at how we integrate polio surveillance into a broader set of vaccine-preventable disease surveillance systems so that we can, det again, detect early if something should happen and then respond quickly. Um, and so the next is that outbreak response capacity followed by um, containment of polioviruses from labs and all other sources so that we don't have some sort of accident that results in uh, a release and a reinfection of the population. The second principle is reducing vaccine-preventable de deaths. Um, that's through uh, improving uh, lifespan vaccination efforts, um, supporting the global goals for measles and rubella elimination, as I've already mentioned, enhancing the global capacity for the de detection and response to VDPVs, um, and working through the global health security agenda to actually improve the national capacities and delivery systems uh, for things that range from vaccination to outbreak control. So the last thing I want to talk about is actually to, to, to go off script for a second. And uh, end with a story. For those of you who do know Dr. Redfield, he uh, tells stories a lot. He tells a lot of stories. Um, and so even though this isn't his story, this is a story that I want to share with you. Um, I think it's in, in uh, something he would definitely do if he were up here. I've only told this story publicly one other time, and I did get a little bit emotional uh, then. So you, you will either have benefit from me having primed myself and on the boost uh, these vaccination terms, I won't get emotional, or you'll benefit from seeing how much this meant to me. Um, in January of 2014, I was actually out on a vaccination campaign in Kano, in rural Kano state of northern Nigeria, one of the strongholds of, of uh, that country's fight against polio uh, for quite a long time. And uh, many of these special techniques that we've been talking about all day were in place there at that time. And so we would do everything from health camps where you got other services to bands playing in the streets to bring the kids out so that you could then 
give them vaccination drops and provide them either a bar of soap or a whistle or something. And so we were on a pretty densely populated street and we had this big band playing. Um, and it was marching, it was like a marching band marching, marching down the street and the kids were coming out and it was just total chaos. And um, new noise and people and structures everywhere. And in the midst of this, this little seven or eight year old girl came up. She, she, I don't know her exact age, but you know, we do this to check if, if you can touch your ear with your hand, it means you're over five and we don't vaccinate you. So she could do that. And so she was older than five. But she whispered something into um, the, the local supervisor's ear. And very quickly he said, we have to go, we have to go. We didn't know exactly why, we didn't know exactly what was going on, but uh, he said, quick, it's important. And so we picked up and we moved and we zigzagged through a couple streets and came to the exact opposite scenario. Um, desolate, empty place. It was like we'd hit the end of the road, uh, half built concrete structures, um, construction going on at sort of a river bed without water, sand everywhere, um, uh, donkeys uh, carrying sand to build the structures. And the little girl escorted us up to this house and we knocked on the door. And so we said, what's happening? And, uh, and uh, the supervisor said, a baby was born last night. And so the little girl went in and got her dad and her little baby brother and brought them out on the front and we snapped a photo and that's why I know where it was and when it was. Um, and the baby got it, its birth dose of vaccine. And that little girl was just excited to be part of the process. And she was so excited to have her little brother that she wanted to give him something. And she didn't know she had given him the opportunity of a life without polio. She had given his parents the opportunity of him having a life without polio. She'd contributed to our global effort. And we are so close to getting that for everyone. It was so thoughtful of her. And she probably will never know what that meant. But we all do. And that's our goal. That's what we're aiming for. So thank you very much. So we're just going to jump into closing remarks. Um, I, just, I want to start off by saying everyone who's put on a conference like this knows that it takes a village. And so I want to say thank you to Steve Morrison and the Global Health Policy Center team, and especially to Alex Bush and Ashwari Raj, uh, who jumped in at uh, fixed some last, did some last minute troubleshooting over the last couple of days, and to Rochelle's son as well. Um, but mostly to my partner in polio, polio Isra Hussein, who is fantastic and unfortunately is leaving us in August and I'll miss her greatly, but this literally would not have happened without her. So thank you so much, Isra. I'd also like to recognize my mother-in-law, Joan Bristol, who is sitting in the back with her handsome son. Um, she herself is a polio survivor and a longtime Rotarian. And uh, she was in fact, some years ago, the president of the Denver Rotary a position that afforded her the opportunity to ride hell-bent for leather in a six-horse coach through the Denver Stock Show. So it just goes to show you, you never know what adventures your Rotary membership will bring you. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to see Global Polio Eradication Initiative in action in several countries, at the U.S. level and at the international level, and I am constantly in awe of the passion and determination of everyone involved, as, as John just demonstrated. Um, from the vaccinators and the social mobilizers in India to surveillance officers in Nepal, to Ethiopian health workers along the border with South Sudan, to epidemiologist trainees in Uganda. From well-traveled CDC and USAID staffers to WHO officials in Geneva. We all know that polio eradication has been a frustratingly unpredictable endeavor, and it's not for lack of perseverance by the people involved. 
And in addition to working against polio, many of these people have also contributed to other health activities and programs that will, may, will remain valuable even after eradication. I liken polio eradication to the development of diamonds, incredible pressure producing shining gems. People in the field, government officials, and international leaders have all been under incredible strain as they seek to reach every child in the world with polio vaccine. And what an audacious goal, every child in the world. And the resources, energy, and international focus to have produced some real treasures. The National Polio Surveillance Project in India, epidemiology training programs, and laboratory innovations. To help understand these polio assets and how they can be applied to other health goals, we are launching this week a new web product called Building Global Health Capacity Through, Global, through Polio Eradication. This site breaks down the infrastructure into its individual parts and sets out to explain what they are, how they are aiding eradication, their potential contribution to other health activities, and the challenges to their continuation. The site is now live with the first three features, which focus on polio emergency operation centers, social mobilization, and the stop transmission of polio program, all things that have been talked about today. Future topics coming in the next weeks and months include polio surveillance and laboratory networks, global partnerships, and monitoring mechanisms, among others. The site was developed by our talented iLab team, and a huge thank you to Rebecca Shirazi, and it, and especially to Sarah Grace, who was our partner in developing this, and she's made this incredibly interactive visual site uh, through her many, many hours and thoughtful work on this project. It's visually appealing, it's interactive, it's aimed at a broad audience to help foster a greater understanding of the potential of a well-planned polio transition. If you want to get a look at the new site, ISRA will be standing in the lobby in front of a large touchscreen TV and can give you a demonstration. You can find the link on these cards that were available when you came in. So stay tuned. We'll be adding to this site um, over the next few months and over the year. And thanks you, thank you to all the participants. We really appreciate you all coming. And for, to Andrew and Ahmed, you came from so far. You made this conference what it was. So, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>